Hello everyone, and welcome back to Midnight Horror. I know many of you use these videos to fall asleep, so before you drift off, I'd love it if you could leave a comment letting me know where you're listening from around the world. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're enjoying the video. Story 1 After my aunt passed away, the family gathered to sort through her belongings. She had always been a bit of an enigma to me, eccentric, fiercely independent, and deeply private. Her house was a reflection of that personality, filled with mismatched furniture, countless trinkets, and an attic that seemed to hold the secrets of her life. On the day I volunteered to help clean out the attic, I felt a mix of trepidation and excitement. I climbed the narrow, creaky stairs, the dust motes dancing in the beams of sunlight that filtered through the small window. It smelled of old books and cedar, a comforting yet melancholic scent. As I sifted through boxes filled with forgotten items, old letters, dusty records, and strange collectibles, I came across a weathered cardboard box tucked away in the corner. Curiosity peaked, I pulled it into the light. It felt heavier than I expected, and I carefully opened it to reveal a collection of photographs. The images were in various sizes, some fading, some still vibrant, all meticulously arranged. I took a deep breath and began to flip through them, my heart racing with each new discovery. What struck me first was that many of the photographs were of me snapshots capturing moments I had never shared with anyone, moments that felt like they were pulled from the fabric of my memory. There I was as a child, laughing with friends at a birthday party, frosting smeared on my face. Another photo showed me on a swing, soaring high, a look of pure joy on my face. I could almost hear the echo of my laughter as I studied the picture. But then, as I flipped through more photos, I began to feel uneasy. These weren't just candid shots, they were intimate glimpses into my life that I had no recollection of sharing. There was a picture of me sitting alone on a park bench, deep in thought, taken from a distance. I had no idea anyone was watching me that day. Another photo showed me at a school play, my face partially hidden behind a curtain, eyes wide with anticipation. It felt eerie, like I was being observed without my consent. Confusion settled in as I continued. There were images of family gatherings, holidays, and moments with friends, but always from angles that suggested someone had been deliberately capturing them without being noticed. In one picture, I was sitting on my aunt's porch, sketching in a notebook, completely unaware of the camera lens pointed in my direction. It felt as if my aunt had been chronicling my life without me knowing, creating a hidden archive of my existence. The more I looked, the more I felt a knot tightening in my stomach. Why had she taken these pictures? What was her intention? I couldn't shake the feeling that I was intruding on something deeply personal, as if I had stumbled upon a diary that wasn't meant for my eyes. Each photograph raised questions that buzzed in my mind, drowning out any sense of nostalgia I might have felt. Suddenly, a particular image caught my eye. It was a close-up shot of my hands, dirty with paint, working on a canvas. I remembered that day clearly. It was a summer afternoon spent painting with my aunt in her backyard. I had felt so inspired, yet here was evidence that she had captured the moment, not just for memory, but for a purpose I couldn't comprehend. I set the photographs down and took a deep breath, trying to steady my racing thoughts. Had she seen something in me that I hadn't recognized? Was she preserving moments that she believed were significant? Or was there something darker at play? Just as I was about to close the box, I noticed an envelope nestled at the bottom. My heart raced as I pulled it out, my fingers trembling slightly. Inside was a letter written in my aunt's distinctive cursive. My dearest, it began, and I could almost hear her voice in my head as I read. If you are reading this, it means I am no longer with you. I want you to understand the importance of these photographs. They are not just memories, they are pieces of you that I wanted to celebrate. You have always been a bright light in my life, and I wanted to capture your essence in ways I felt were authentic and true. As I continued reading, my emotions shifted from confusion to warmth. She spoke of her love for me and her desire to preserve the moments that made me who I was. She urged me to embrace my creativity and not to shy away from expressing myself. You are an artist in your own right, she wrote, and I hope these photographs remind you of the beauty that you bring to the world. Tears welled in my eyes as I absorbed her words. I realized that her obsession with documenting my life had come from a place of love and admiration, not surveillance. She had seen potential in me, even when I couldn't see it in myself. 
The photographs were a gift, a reminder that I was cherished, that my experiences mattered. With newfound appreciation, I returned to the box and examined the photos again. I could see my aunt's love in each frame. There were images of me celebrating small victories, my enthusiasm captured in vibrant colors. It was as if she had been my silent cheerleader, believing in me even when I doubted myself. As I continued to sift through the memories, I felt a shift within me. The initial discomfort gave way to gratitude. I was not just a subject of her gaze, I was part of her legacy, a connection that transcended her physical absence. I decided that I would honor her memory by embracing the creativity she had always encouraged in me. Over the next few weeks, I hung the photographs around my own home, each image telling a story that was uniquely mine. They became a source of inspiration, a reminder of the love that had shaped me. I even started painting again, letting my emotions flow onto the canvas, just as I had that summer afternoon with my aunt. I finding those photographs was more than a discovery, it was a revelation that reignited a spark in my life. My aunt's spirit lived on in those images, encouraging me to explore my passions, to be unafraid, and to cherish the moments that made me who I was. In the end, I learned that even in absence, love has a way of lingering, capturing our essence long after we think we've been pinned forgotten. Story 2 As I walked through the creaking halls of my childhood home, a mix of nostalgia and sadness washed over me. After my parents passed away, I had returned to sort through their belongings, a task that felt both necessary and deeply unsettling. The memories embedded in the walls echoed around me, but now they were tinged with the sorrow of loss. The house had always felt like a refuge, filled with laughter, love, and warmth. But now, the empty rooms were filled with shadows and silence. I wandered through the living room, the familiar scent of old wood and worn carpets triggering a flood of memories, birthdays, holidays, late night talks. As I climbed the stairs, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was waiting for me. In my old bedroom, the air felt thick with the weight of the past. The closet doors, slightly ajar, seemed to beckon me. I hesitated, then opened them fully, revealing a jumble of clothes and forgotten toys. As I rummaged through the fabric, I noticed a small, leather-bound diary tucked away in the corner, its cover dusty but intact. Curiosity peak, I pulled it out, brushing off the dust. It felt heavy in my hands, like it held secrets yearning to be released. I opened it carefully, the pages crackling beneath my fingers. The handwriting was elegant but shaky, indicating it had been written some time ago. The first entry was dated over 20 years ago. August 12th, 1998. Today I found out I was pregnant. I don't know how to feel. There's so much to consider finances, our lives, the future. But deep down I know this child will bring us joy. I swallowed hard, realizing this was my mother's diary. Each entry was a glimpse into her thoughts, her worries, her dreams. I felt a rush of intimacy like I was peering into her soul. But as I continued reading, I encountered darker themes. September 20th, 1999 I thought having a child would bring us closer. But the distance between us grows every day. I'm afraid of what this means for our family. I don't think he understands what I need. A knot formed in my stomach. My parents had always seemed so united, so loving. To read this hurt it shattered the image I held of their perfect marriage. I flipped through the pages, searching for more insights. The entries spiraled into a complexity I hadn't anticipated. March 3rd, 2000. The fighting has become unbearable. I never thought it would come to this. The nights are filled with silence and I lie awake, wondering if we'll ever find our way back to each other. As I read on, it became clear that my father had struggled with depression. My mother documented her attempts to support him, her feelings of helplessness, and the growing strain on their relationship. I began to see my childhood home and in a different light every moment of joy was underpinned by an unseen tension. One entry stood out, dated several months before I was born. January 15, 2001, I'm terrified when I found out about the affair. I never thought it would happen to us. He swears it was just a mistake, but I can't shake this feeling of betrayal. I need to protect our family. My breath caught in my throat. A fair. This was a truth I had never suspected. The image of my father as a loving husband and devoted father began to fracture. 
I continued reading, desperate for more context, trying to understand how this had shaped the life I had known. On February 2nd, 2001, I confronted him today. He confessed. I thought I would be strong, but when I saw the pain in his eyes, I couldn't do it. I didn't want to lose him. I can't imagine raising our child alone. My heart sank deeper. I had always believed my parents had built a solid foundation based on love, but now it felt fragile, riddled with cracks. The entries revealed a cycle of conflict and reconciliation, love and pain. It was raw, unfiltered, and devastating. And I came across an entry dated just before my 10th birthday. April 18th, 2005, I finally told her. I couldn't keep it hidden any longer. I needed to prepare her for the truth. The affair was hard to forget, but of course, these the choice I made to stay. I hope she understands someday. I flipped the page, eager for more, but the diary ended abruptly there. My heart raced as I absorbed what I had just read, but truth had my mother revealed to me. Did she mean my existence was a result of the affair? Or did she question whether I was wanted? The implications rattled me to the core. I set the diary down, my mind racing. I had to confront my memories, the moments I had cherished alongside this new understanding. How could I reconcile the love I felt with the pain my parents had endured? Had they truly been happy, or was it all a facade? I spent the rest of the day poring over the diary, trying to piece together my parents' lives and the secrets they had hidden. Every entry felt like a layer of a complex puzzle, revealing both their humanity and their vulnerabilities. I realized that their love story was not a straightforward tale of romance, it was messy, flawed, and undeniably real. In the days that followed, I found myself revisiting my childhood memories with fresh eyes. I recalled the times my father had seemed distant, the hushed arguments that had spilled into the living room late at night. I had always dismissed them as growing pains in a marriage, but now they felt like haunting echoes of unresolved issues. I decided to confront my feelings head on. I wrote a letter to my mother, expressing the confusion and heartbreak I felt. I poured out my emotions, detailing how the diary had changed my perspective on my family. I wanted her to know that I understood the weight of their choices, that I recognized their struggle. A week later, as I was packing up more of their belongings, I stumbled upon an old photo album. I opened it gingerly, and as I flipped through the pages, I found images of my parents in happier times smiling, carefree, radiant. It struck me that despite the darkness, they had fought to create a life for me filled with love and laughter. In that moment, I realized that their story was one of resilience. They had weathered storms that I couldn't comprehend, and through it all, they had chosen to stay together, to raise me with a hope of brighter days. I understood that love isn't perfect, it's a journey marked by choices and sacrifices. As I closed the album, I felt a sense of peace settle over me. My parents had carried their secrets, but they had also given me the gift of life a life where I could choose to embrace love, even in its imperfect form. I made a vow to honor their legacy to live authentically and openly, and to create a future filled with love, understanding, and the courage to face the truths that lie ahead. Story 3 At first I thought it was harmless fun. My neighbor Greg was known for his quirky sense of humor, and when I found the first note tucked under my doormat, I chuckled. It was a simple, playful message. The moon looks beautiful tonight, but beware of the shadows. I dismissed it as Greg's idea of a joke. He had a knack for being eccentric, and his pranks usually involved a clever twist. Days went by, and more notes appeared. Some were silly riddles, others were puns about the weather or local events. I'd share them with my husband, Tom, and we'd laugh about Greg's antics over dinner. He should be a comedian. I'd joke, rolling my eyes at his silliness. But with each note, a small part of me felt a twinge of unease. It was a rainy Thursday when I found the next note. The sky was gray and the air felt heavy as I bent down to pick it up. This one was different. It was a single piece of paper, the words scrawled in a jagged handwriting that sent chills down my spine. Your family won't be safe if you keep ignoring the signs. I stood frozen, heart racing. This wasn't funny anymore. I glanced around the quiet street, searching for any sign of Greg or anyone else lurking nearby. The only sound was the patter of rain against the pavement. I hurried inside, the note crumpled tightly in my fist. What's wrong? Tom asked when I entered. I showed him the note, my voice shaking. 
This is getting out of hand. It's no longer a prank. Tom's brow furrowed as he read the words. You think Greg is serious? I don't know, but I don't want to take any chances. We should talk to him. That evening, we walked over to Greg's house, the tension hanging in the air. I knocked on the door, and after a moment, it creaked open. Greg stood there, a bemused expression on his face. Hey, neighbors, what's up? He asked, his tone lighthearted. I forced a smile, trying to suppress the anxiety bubbling inside me. We wanted to talk to you about the notes. His smile faltered for a moment, and I caught a glimmer of something in his eyes. Was it mischief, or something darker? All those, just a bit of fun, right? Greg, they're starting to feel threatening, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. The last one that didn't sit right with me. He laughed, but there was an edge to it that made my skin crawl. Simon, it's just a bit of harmless fun. You know how I am. Harmless? It feels like it's crossing a line, Tom interjected. We don't appreciate it. Greg's expression shifted slightly, a flicker of annoyance passing across his face. All right, all right. I'll tone it down. No hard feelings. I nodded, but a knot of unease formed in my stomach as we walked back home. I wanted to believe him, but the feeling that something wasn't right lingered like a shadow. That night, I had trouble sleeping. Every creak of the house made me jump. I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, my mind racing with worst-case scenarios. I thought about our two young children asleep down the hall. How could I protect them if Greg was serious? The following days were marked by a tense silence. The notes stopped, but I felt an eerie calm settling over our neighborhood. It was as if Greg had retreated into the shadows. I found myself peering out the window, watching for any sign of him, but nothing happened. The days blurred into weeks and I tried to convince myself that I was overreacting. Then one afternoon, while I was in the kitchen preparing lunch, my phone buzzed with a notification. It was a message from an unknown number. My heart raced as I opened it. The screen displayed a picture of our house, taken from the street. Panic washed over me. I glanced out the window, my heart pounding. I rushed to the front door and looked outside. Nothing seemed out of place, but my skin prickled with fear. I ran to Tom, who was working in the living room. Tom, I just got a message with a photo of our house, I said, breathless. He immediately grabbed his phone and called the police, his face growing serious as he relayed the situation. After hanging up, he turned to me. We need to take this seriously. They'll send someone to check things out. A wave of relief washed over me, but it was quickly overshadowed by anxiety. We decided to stay vigilant, locking all the doors and keeping the lights on. The kids sensed our tension, and I tried to maintain a facade of calm for their sake. That evening, after the kids were asleep, Tom and I sat in the living room, discussing the recent events. Suddenly, a loud bang jolted us both. We exchanged terrified glances, and my heart raced as I tiptoed to the window. Outside, I saw a figure standing in the shadows, Greg. What is he doing? I whispered, my voice trembling. Tom walked over, peering out beside me. Should we call the police again? Before I could respond, Greg raised his hand and waved, a twisted grin spreading across his face. My stomach turned. This wasn't just a neighbor stopping by, it felt like a taunt. I'm going to confront him, Tom said, his jaw set with determination. I grabbed his arm. No, wait, it could be dangerous. But Tom was already heading for the door. I followed, fear clawing at my insides. As we stepped outside, Greg's grin widened, and he stepped forward. Hey there. What's the matter? You look a little spooked, he said, his tone playful but laced with something darker. What do you want, Greg? Tom asked, trying to keep his voice steady. I just wanted to check in. You seemed a bit tense lately, he replied, the gleam in his eyes unsettling. Cut the act. We want you to stay away from our family, Tom said firmly. Greg's smile faltered for a moment before he chuckled. Come on, it's all in good fun. Just a little scared of living things up but the laughter that followed felt hollow, and the tension in the air was palpable. I felt trapped, like we were standing on the edge of a precipice, ready to fall. Enough, I shouted, surprising myself with the force of my voice. This isn't a game, NUB. We want you to stop. For a moment, silence hung heavy between us. Then Greg's expression shifted, his playful facade slipping away, revealing a more sinister intent. And you think you can just tell me what to do? I'll decide when this game is over. Tom stepped closer, protective. 
This isn't a joke. You're crossing lines and we're done playing. Greg's smile faded completely. You'll regret this, he spat before turning on his heel and striding away, disappearing into the night. We stood there, hearts pounding, the weight of his threat hanging over us like a storm cloud. The feeling of safety had vanished, replaced by an overwhelming sense of dread. That night, we called the police again, but I knew that a call wouldn't solve everything. I felt exposed and vulnerable, as if the walls of our home had turned into a fragile facade. In the days that followed, we took every precaution. We installed security cameras, locked all doors, and kept the blinds drawn tight. I could feel Greg's presence lurking just outside, like a ghost refusing to leave. Despite our efforts, the feeling of being watched never faded. I found myself glancing out the window more often, half expecting to see him lurking in the shadows. The kids sensed the change in the air, and I did my best to shield them from the fear that consumed me. As weeks turned into months, the sense of impending doom began to fade, but the scars of the experience lingered. We learned to be cautious, to trust our instincts, and to protect our family fiercely. And although the notes stopped and Greg faded from our daily lives, the shadows remained, a constant reminder that sometimes, what begins as a harmless prank can evolve into a sinister reality. Story 4 The last time I saw Mia was at the coffee shop, where we had spent hours laughing and planning our upcoming road trip. She had been so vibrant, her eyes sparkling with excitement. But then she vanished. The days that followed felt like a surreal nightmare. The police had done their best, but after a week of searching, they were running out of leads. I felt helpless. Every time I picked up my phone, I half expected to see a message from her, a sign that she was safe. But those hopes faded with each passing day. The world moved on, but I was stuck in limbo, anxiously waiting for news that never came. Then one evening, my phone buzzed. I was sprawled on the couch, staring blankly at the TV when I saw Mia's name flash across the screen. My heart raced as I opened the message, only to find a cryptic text, you need to know the truth about where I am. The message sent chills down my spine. I quickly glanced at the timestamp just minutes ago. There was no way it could be her. Her phone was still in the police's possession, locked away in evidence. I texted back frantically, asking if she was okay, but there was no response. I sat there heart pounding, my mind racing. Was someone playing a sick joke? I wanted to call the police, but what would I say? They already thought I was grasping at straws, obsessing over Mia's disappearance. Instead, I decided to analyze the message further. The words felt loaded, almost as if they carried a weight that was more than just a personal plea. An hour passed, and my phone buzzed again. This time, it was another message. It's not safe to talk here. You need to listen carefully. Panic set in. Who could be sending these messages? I felt a surge of determination wash over me. I needed to find out where Mia was and what was really happening. I started typing a response, asking who was sending the messages, but then my phone lit up with another notification. They're watching you. You need to go to the old park. Tonight, you'll find what you need there. My hands shook as I read it. The old park was a place Mia and I used to frequent. A secluded area where we would escape from the world. It felt like a clue and against my better judgment, I felt drawn to it. As darkness settled in, I grabbed my jacket and headed out. The cool air brushed against my skin, heightening my senses as I approached the park. The moon hung low in the sky, casting eerie shadows on the ground. My heart raced with a mix of fear and anticipation. When I arrived, I noticed the familiar swings swaying gently in the breeze. The sound of rustling leaves echoed around me making the silence feel even more pronounced. I took a deep breath, summoning courage as I scanned the area. Suddenly my phone buzzed again. Look under the old oak tree. I rushed over, my pulse quickening. Kneeling down, I brushed away the leaves and dirt at the base of the tree. My fingers found something cold and hard, a small metal box. I pried it open, revealing a collection of items a bracelet I recognized at Mia's a faded photo of us from a trip years ago, and a note. With trembling hands, I unfolded the paper. It read, If you're reading this, I'm in trouble. I found something I shouldn't have. They're after me. I thought I could handle it, but I was wrong. I need you to trust me. Don't tell anyone. Just find the others. My breath caught in my throat. What had Mia stumbled into? The mention of the others sent a wave of dread through me. 
I looked around, feeling exposed. My instincts screamed that I wasn't alone. Before I could process everything, I heard footsteps approaching. I scrambled to my feet and hid behind the tree, my heart racing. I peered around the trunk, trying to get a glimpse of who was coming. The shadows shifted, and I caught sight of two figures men I didn't recognize. They seemed to be searching the area, their voices low and conspiratorial. We need to find her before she talks, one said, a sense of urgency in his tone. If she goes to the police, everything is over. Panic surged through me. Mia had uncovered something dangerous, something that could threaten more than just her life. My mind raced, desperately trying to piece it together. I needed to warn her, to find out who these men were and what they wanted. As they moved closer, I slipped back into the darkness, clutching the metal box tightly. My heart thudded in my chest as I carefully retraced my steps, praying they wouldn't spot me. Once I reached the edge of the park, I turned to run, adrenaline coursing through me. I sprinted home, locking the door behind me. My mind raced with the implications of what I had just learned. I needed to act quickly. I couldn't trust anyone, not even the police. That night, I sat in my living room, piecing together everything I knew. The whispers and the messages haunted me, each one more chilling than the last. Mia was in serious danger, and it was up to me to find out how deep this went. I decided to contact a few of Mia's other close friends, people she had confided in over the years. They might have insights, or perhaps they too had noticed something odd in the days leading up to her disappearance. One by one I called them, feeling a sense of urgency. When I reached Alex, he paused for a moment before answering. You've heard from Mia. I don't know who's texting me, but I found some things at the park that she left, I replied, my voice shaky. She's in trouble, Alex. We need to figure this out. His silence felt heavy, a weight that pressed down on my chest. I have to tell you something. Mia was investigating something big. She found something online that was connected to a series of disappearances in the area. I thought it was just a conspiracy theory, but now I don't know. My heart sank. The pieces began to fit together, and the chill in reality settled in. Mia hadn't just vanished, she had stumbled into a web of darkness that extended far beyond what I could comprehend. The next day, I decided to return to the park, armed with the knowledge I had gained. I had to find the others Mia mentioned. Maybe they could help me understand what was happening. Story 5 The quaint town of Eldridge appeared idyllic at first glance, with its picturesque streets lined with old oak trees and charming cottages adorned with flower boxes. I was drawn to the peaceful ambience, eager to escape the chaos of city life. However, the deeper I settled into my new home, the more I sensed an undercurrent of unease. On my first day, I attended the local market, hoping to mingle and get a feel for the community. The townspeople were friendly enough, greeting me with warm smiles and polite waves. Yet, beneath their cheerful exteriors, I noticed something peculiar in their eyes and intensity that seemed to scrutinize my every move. I brushed it off as small-town curiosity, but the feeling lingered. As weeks passed, I tried to integrate myself into the town, joining a few clubs and attending community events. I found a cozy cafe that quickly became my favorite spot where I would sip coffee and write in my journal. Each visit, I felt the eyes of the barista, an older woman named Agnes, lingering on me longer than necessary. One afternoon, I gathered the courage to ask her about the town's traditions. Oh, we have our ways, she replied, her voice laced with a hint of caution. Eldridge is always believed in keeping balance with the forces beyond our understanding. It's important for newcomers to respect our customs. I felt a chill race down my spine. What do you mean by forces? I pressed, curious yet apprehensive. She hesitated, her expression clouding over. It's best not to dwell on such matters. I just remember this town is very much alive, and so are its traditions. Intrigued but unsettled, I continued to ask around, but most residents deflected my questions, changing the subject or offering vague reassurances. I could sense a thick wall of secrecy surrounding them, and with each inquiry, I felt more like an outsider. One evening, I was invited to a local gathering in the town square, a monthly event where residents shared stories and food under the stars. I arrived eager to bond with my neighbors, but as the night wore on, the atmosphere grew heavy. Laughter faded, and whispers filled the air, each person glancing around as if waiting for something. At the stroke of midnight, a hush fell over the crowd. 
The townspeople gathered in a tight circle, their faces serious and solemn. I watched in confusion as they began to chant in unison, their voices rising and falling in an unsettling rhythm. A chill settled deep within me, and I felt an instinctive urge to leave. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the shadows, a man draped in a dark cloak, his face obscured. He approached the center of the circle, raising his arms as the chanting grew louder. My heart raced as I realized they were not simply celebrating, they were performing a ritual. Panic surged through me. I glanced around, searching for an escape route. The townspeople seemed entranced, their eyes fixed on the figure. I slipped away from the crowd, making my way back to my car. The drive home was a blur of anxiety and confusion, and I struggled to piece together what I had witnessed. The next day, I returned to the cafe, hoping for answers. Agnes was there, her demeanor unusually grim. I decided to confront her. What was that last night? What are you all doing? She sighed, glancing around to ensure no one was listening. You're not supposed to know about the sacrifices, she whispered, her voice trembling. It's been a tradition for generations. The unseen force our town's protector requires offerings. Newcomers are often chosen. My blood ran cold. Sacrifices? What do you mean? Every few years, a newcomer is selected to maintain balance, she explained, her eyes filled with sorrow. It's a part of our way of life. Those who resist are met with consequences. As I absorbed her words, disbelief and horror washed over me. I realized I was now part of something far darker than I had ever imagined. But why me? I stammered. I've done nothing to deserve this. Not your fault, she replied softly. It's just the way it is. You came here looking for peace, and now you're entangled in our fate. Desperation surged within me. I needed to leave. I hurried home, determined to pack my things and escape this nightmare. But as night fell, an ominous feeling settled over the town. The streets felt alive with a strange energy, and shadows danced ominously against the dim light. I glanced out my window and saw figures moving in the darkness, silhouettes creeping toward my house. My heart raced as I realized the townspeople were coming for me. I had to act fast. I grabbed my car keys and dashed outside, heart pounding. As I reached my car, the figures emerged from the shadows, revealing their faces hollow eyes, expressions of determination. You can't leave, one of them called out. You belong to Eldridge now. Panic flooded my veins as I fumbled with the car door. I managed to get inside, slamming the door shut. As I turned the key in the ignition, the engine sputtered, refusing to start. The crowd drew closer, their chants echoing in the night air. You must fulfill your role, they sang in unison. I banged on the steering wheel, desperately trying to coax the engine to life. It finally roared to life, and I hit the gas tires screeching against the pavement as I tore down the street. I could hear their chants fading behind me, but I knew I couldn't let my guard down. The road twisted and turned, and I drove without looking back, racing toward the edge of town. Just as I thought I had escaped, I felt a sudden jolt, as if something invisible had grabbed hold of my car. The engine sputtered, and the headlights flickered ominously. No, no, no. I shouted, panic rising. I wrestled with the steering wheel, but the car began to slow, finally coming to a stop. I jumped out, adrenaline coursing through my veins, and sprinted into the woods beside the road. The trees loomed overhead, shadows wrapping around me like a cloak. I pushed forward, branches scratching at my arms and face desperate to escape the malevolent grip of Eldridge. Behind me, I could hear the townspeople closing in, their chants echoing through the trees. As I ran, I stumbled upon a small clearing, illuminated by the pale light of the moon. I collapsed to the ground, panting heavily. The whispers grew louder, and I could feel their presence creeping closer. I knew I had to hide. But frantically, I searched for cover and spotted a hollowed-out tree trunk nearby. I crawled inside, heart pounding as I pressed my back against the cool bark. I held my breath, hoping to go unnoticed as the chance grew nearer. The figures entered the clearing, their faces illuminated by the moonlight. They moved like a swarm, searching, their voices rising in urgency. Find her. She cannot escape her destiny. My heart raced as I listened, every fiber of my being screaming for me to ring silent. As they spread out, I felt the tension in the air the weight of their determination bearing down on me. Minutes felt like hours as I waited, adrenaline coursing through my veins, 
Just when I thought they might leave, the leader of the group stepped forward, his voice rising above the others. The force demands a sacrifice. We cannot fail. Suddenly, a strange wind rushed through the clearing, and I felt the air shift, as if the unseen force were responding to their call. My heart raced as I understood the magnitude of the situation. I had become more than just a newcomer. I was now a pivotal part of their dark tradition. But I refused to be their offering. In that moment of clarity, I realized that I could fight back. I was not powerless. I mustered all my strength and crawled deeper into the hollow tree, using the darkness as my ally. As the townspeople continued their search, I began to formulate a plan. If I could draw the force away from the town, perhaps I could escape their grasp. I had to disrupt the ritual they were performing, and the first step was to break their connection to the unseen force. With newfound determination, I quietly gathered fallen branches and leaves, forming a barrier at the entrance of the hollow trunk. I needed to create a diversion, something that would lure them away from me. As I worked, I could hear their chants growing more frantic, their desperation palpable. Once my makeshift barricade was complete, I took a deep breath and began to chant words I had overheard them using. It felt strange and foreign on my tongue, but I focused on invoking the unseen force with my own twist, channeling my own will into the incantation. As my voice filled the air, the wind picked up, swirling around the clearing. The townspeople paused, their heads snapping in my direction. I could see their eyes widening in disbelief as they realized something was amiss. My heart raced, but I pushed through, amplifying my voice. The energy shifted, and I felt a surge of power. The unseen force responded to my call, but instead of anger, it seemed to be intrigued. I focused on that connection, pouring my fear and defiance into the words I spoke. The townspeople began to panic, their chants faltering as they felt the change in the air. I watched as they turned, confusion replacing their determination. The energy of the clearing crackled with tension, and in that moment I understood that I could control the situation. With one final surge of strength, I raised my voice higher, summoning the unseen force to shift its focus. The ground trembled beneath me and I felt the power build around us. The townspeople were now caught in the storm I had unleashed, and their desperate cries filled the air. In the chaos, I seized my opportunity. I darted from the hollow trunk, sprinting back toward the road. I could hear the cries of the townspeople behind me, their chants disintegrating into shouts of confusion and fear. The energy in the air crackled, and I felt the unseen force pulsing with potential. Story 6 The nightmares began softly, whispers of a world I didn't recognize. At first, they felt like fleeting dreams, shadows flitting through my subconscious, moments that slipped away upon waking. I found myself in a foggy landscape, the air thick with a sense of foreboding. Each night, the scenes grew more detailed, more intense. I wandered through darkened woods past twisted trees that seemed to reach out with gnarled fingers. The moon hung heavy in the sky, casting an eerie glow over a clearing where a dilapidated cabin stood. Initially, I dismissed these visions as mere figments of my imagination, remnants of a tired mind. But as the nights wore on, the dreams morphed into something darker. I could hear whispers calling out to me, pulling me deeper into that haunting place. The faces appeared ghostly figures hovering at the edges of my consciousness, their eyes filled with sorrow and desperation. I began to feel an unsettling connection to this strange location, as if it were beckoning me to uncover a hidden truth. After a particularly vivid nightmare, I awoke in a cold sweat. The cabin's image burned into my mind. The unsettling feeling clung to me throughout the day, and I found myself drawn to the local library. I spent hours combing through old newspapers and local archives, searching for clues about the place that haunted my dreams. Each article I uncovered deepened the mystery, revealing tales of the cabin hidden in the woods, a place where several people had disappeared over the years, leaving behind only whispers and rumors. The story sent chills down my spine. There had been one disappearance in particular that caught my attention a young woman named Clara, who had vanished almost two decades ago. The details were sparse, but the words lost forever echoed in my mind. Something about her story resonated with me, igniting a sense of urgency I couldn't explain. I felt compelled to learn more, to delve deeper into the shadows that cloaked the cabin. Over the next few days, my obsession grew, 
I visited the woods driven by an inexplicable pull. As I walked the trails, the air grew thicker with tension, and the sunlight seemed to dim, swallowed by the looming trees. I recalled the details from my dreams, the way the path twisted and turned, leading me deeper into the heart of the forest. Every step brought me closer to the clearing where the cabin stood, where Clara had last been seen. When I finally reached the clearing, my breath caught in my throat. The cabin loomed before me, a decaying structure wrapped in vines and shadows. I felt an overwhelming sense of deja vu, as if I had walked this path countless times before. The air was still, heavy with unspoken secrets. I approached cautiously, every instinct urging me to turn back, yet something deeper compelled me to continue. As I stepped inside, the door creaked ominously, revealing a darkened interior filled with remnants of the past. Dust motes danced in the faint light that filtered through broken windows. The air was thick with the scent of mold and decay. I felt an almost palpable presence, as if the very walls were steeped in the sorrow of lost souls. The whispers intensified in my mind, calling out to me, urging me to remember. In the far corner, I spotted a tattered journal resting atop a dusty table. My heart raced as I picked it up. The pages yellowed and fragile. The handwriting was familiar, yet foreign a mix of elegance and desperation. It was Clara's journal, filled with thoughts and dreams, hopes and fears. As I read her words, I felt a connection that transcended time. She wrote of the woods, of the cabin, and of the darkness that loomed over her like a specter. Her final entries were frantic, filled with dread and a sense of being watched. I can feel them she had written. They are here with me, waiting. Each sentence pulled me deeper into her story, intertwining our fates in ways I couldn't comprehend. I could almost hear her voice, echoing in my mind, urging me to help her find peace. Suddenly the air shifted, growing colder. I glanced around, heart racing, as shadows flickered in the corners of the room. The whispers grew louder, almost deafening the cacophony of despair and longing. I felt Clara's presence envelop me, a palpable energy that sent shivers down my spine. Help me, her voice pleaded, clear and urgent. Story 7 It started as a vague sense of unease, a creeping sensation that something wasn't right in my apartment. At first, I brushed it off as the product of a long week and too many late nights at work. But as I went about my daily routine, I began to notice odd symbols etched onto the walls, faint but unmistakable. They appeared in the corners of rooms, hidden in shadows as if waiting to be discovered. The first one I spotted was a small, spiraled shape in the living room, almost resembling a nautilus shell. I thought perhaps it was just an old scratch or a paint smudge, but as the days passed, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was deliberate. Curiosity morphed into obsession. I started seeing more symbols, jagged lines that formed strange geometric shapes. Crude figures with hollow eyes and lines that seemed to intertwine like roots digging into the wall. I felt like I was being watched, each Marcus Island observer in my home. One evening after a particularly grueling day at work, I decided to take a closer look. I grabbed my phone and started documenting them, snapping pictures of the most prominent symbols. I could almost hear my heart beating in rhythm with, with the quiet of the apartment. The unease settled deeper in my gut. Once I had a collection of images, I turned to the internet for answers. Typing in a few of the more prominent symbols, I quickly stumbled upon a thread discussing dark cults and their rituals. My stomach dropped as I read about various symbols linked to ancient practices, all revolving around the worship of forgotten deities. It was a chilling realization. These were not just random marks that were steeped in a sinister history. The more I read, the more unnerved I became. Some symbols represented sacrifice, others were linked to communication with otherworldly entities. I felt a surge of panic, I had unknowingly invited something dark into my life. I tried to convince myself it was all a coincidence, but every new discovery only deepened my fear. Days turned into a blur of paranoia. I began avoiding the darker corners of my apartment, pulling back the curtains to let in as much light as possible. Still, I couldn't escape the symbols. They seemed to multiply. New ones appeared as if they were manifesting overnight. I even considered that maybe I was losing my mind. Perhaps the stress of work had pushed me too far. One night, unable to sleep, I paced the living room. My eyes darted around, searching for signs of the supernatural. I reached for a small flashlight, determined to inspect every corner. With each beam of light illuminating the walls, I felt a mounting dread. 
Then I saw it a massive symbol etched into the wall behind the couch, one I hadn't noticed before. It was intricate, almost beautiful in a twisted way, yet menacing. It resembled a large, spiraled sun with tendrils reaching outwards, almost as if it were trying to escape the wall. My breath hitched in my throat, and I stepped back, feeling the chill of the air. That night's sleep eluded me. I felt trapped in my own home, tormented by the symbols that had invaded my life. I reached for my phone again, delving deeper into the rabbit hole of online discussions about cults and symbols. I stumbled across an obscure blog that detailed the supposed ritual for cleansing spaces haunted by dark energies. It involved a mixture of salts, specific herbs, and a chant. Desperate, I saved the page and resolved to try it. The next day, I gathered the ingredients, sea salt, rosemary, and sage. I felt ridiculous like a character in a bad horror movie, but at that point I would try anything. That evening, armed with my supplies, I began the ritual feeling foolish yet determined. I sprinkled salt around the living room and kitchen, creating barriers against whatever malevolent force might be lurking. I lit the sage and waved it around the rooms, allowing the smoke to curl and fill the air. As I chanted the words I had memorized, I felt an odd sensation, as if the air thickened around me. The symbols seemed to waver under the smoke, flickering in and out of focus. I closed my eyes, pouring all my fear and desperation into the chant. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed from the back of the apartment, causing me to jump. My heart raced as I swung around, half expecting something to leap out from the shadows. But nothing happened. The noise faded, leaving behind an eerie silence. I opened my eyes and felt a shift in the air, a slight lightening of the oppressive weight that had been hanging over me. Perhaps it worked. I finished the ritual and sat on the couch, exhausted but hopeful. Over the next few days, I felt a change. The oppressive atmosphere began to lift, and I noticed fewer symbols appearing. Maybe, just maybe, I had managed to push whatever dark energy had invaded my space back into the shadows. Ah. Rond. But my relief was short-lived. One evening, as I sat on the couch scrolling through my phone, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned, and my heart stopped. The wall behind me was covered in symbols, darker and more pronounced than before. They seemed to pulse with a life of their own, twisting and contorting as if they were alive. I jumped to my feet, my mind racing. How could this happen? I had done everything right. I backed away, my breath coming in quick gasps. The walls felt like they were closing in, the symbols drawing closer beckoning me into their dark embrace. As I stumbled towards the door, I could hear whispers echoing in my mind, a chorus of voices that seemed to chant in unison. It was as if the symbols were alive, taunting me, revealing a deeper connection to the darkness I had tried to escape. The weight of dread settled in my chest, and I knew that I could no longer ignore what was happening. In that moment, I realized that the symbols were not just marks on the wall, they were a part of something larger. A dark thread woven into my life. I had stumbled into a world I didn't understand, and now it was demanding my attention. My apartment no longer felt like a home. It had become a battleground. With every breath, I felt the pull of the symbols drawing me closer to their secrets. I knew I had to confront this darkness head on, to unravel the mystery of what had been unleashed within my walls. The journey ahead would be fraught with danger, but I was determined to uncover the truth, even if it meant facing the shadows that lurked just beyond my reach. Story 8 The invitation arrived unexpectedly, a sleek black envelope with ornate lettering. I flipped it over, half expecting a prank, but the embossed seal bore no signs of familiarity. You were cordially invited to an exclusive gathering at Willowcrest Manor. It read, the words curling into a promise of mystery and intrigue. I felt a shiver of excitement mixed with apprehension. Willowcrest Manor. The name stirred something deep within me, an echo of childhood memories that I had long tried to suppress. I'd heard whispers about the mansion growing up, tales spun by local kids on dark nights when shadows seemed to come alive. The house had been abandoned for years, steeped in stories of tragedy and loss. I recalled the worn images from my nightmares, the crumbling facade, the overgrown gardens, the sense of dread that hung in the air. Despite my reservations, curiosity gnawed at me. I hadn't been back to my hometown in years, and the idea of exploring the manor was enticing. Perhaps this was a chance to confront the fears that had haunted me. 
I hesitated only briefly before accepting the invitation, determined to face the specter of my past. As I drove towards the mansion, the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the winding road. The trees closed in around me, their branches twisted and gnarled, resembling skeletal hands reaching toward the sky. I parked at the edge of the estate, heart pounding as I stepped out. The manor loomed ahead, a grand structure shrouded in ivy and darkness, its windows glinting ominously like eyes watching my every move. The gravel path led me to the entrance, where flickering lanterns cast a soft glow. The heavy wooden door creaked open as I approached, revealing a dimly lit foyer filled with people milling about, laughter echoing off the high ceilings. The grandeur of the interior struck me, with its antique furniture and opulent chandeliers, but a sense of unease lurked just beneath the surface. I felt out of place, a stranger among the elegantly dressed guests. They conversed animatedly, seemingly oblivious to the mansion's unsettling aura. I wandered through the rooms, my heart racing as memories of childhood fears clawed their way back to the forefront of my mind. Ah, uh, the parlor, with its faded portraits and dusty bookshelves, felt eerily familiar, as if I had stepped into a dream I had tried to forget. In a corner, I spotted a group gathered around a table filled with odd trinkets, an old music box, a cracked mirror, and a porcelain doll with a haunting smile. As I approached, I overheard snippets of conversation about the mansion's history. They say it's cursed, one woman whispered, her voice barely above a hush. Anyone who stays too long is never seen again. The chilling words sent a shiver down my spine, but I forced myself to stay. I continued exploring, drawn to a door at the far end of the hall, slightly ajar. My heart pounded as I pushed it open, revealing a narrow staircase leading down into darkness. The air grew cold and I hesitated, caught between my curiosity and the instinct to flee. Yet something compelled me forward, the need to confront my fears stronger than my desire to turn back. The staircase creaked underfoot, and I descended cautiously, the light above fading until I was enveloped in shadows. At the bottom I found myself in a dimly lit cellar, the walls lined with dusty wine racks and cobwebs. A faint sound echoed through the darkness, a whispering, almost like a voice calling to me. My pulse quickened, and I strained to hear, hoping to make sense of the unsettling feeling that enveloped me. Help me. The voice was barely audible, laced with despair. I turned, heart racing, and stumbled upon an old trunk in the corner, its lid slightly ajar. My hands trembled as I approached it, memories flooding back images of a child, lost and afraid, trapped in a nightmare of my own creation. With a deep breath, I opened the trunk. Inside lay a collection of faded photographs, each one depicting moments from my past birthdays, family gatherings, and an image of the very mansion I stood in now. A chill swept through me as I spotted a photo of a girl who looked strikingly familiar. It was me, but taken years before I could remember. My hands shook as I reached for it, the edges crumbling beneath my fingers. Suddenly, the whispers grew louder, filling the room with a cacophony of voices. You shouldn't be here. It's not safe. Panic surged through me as I realized these were the remnants of my childhood fears manifesting in this haunted space. I stumbled back, colliding with the trunk as the voices crescendoed, echoing in a chaotic symphony of warnings. In that moment, clarity washed over me. The nightmares I had run from were tied to this place my own fears had taken root in the mansion's walls. I had allowed the stories and legends to dictate my perception for too long. No longer would I be a prisoner of my past. With newfound determination, I turned to leave, making my way back up the stairs, where whispers faded behind me, replaced by the distant sound of laughter from the party above. I stepped back into the foyer, feeling the warmth of the gathering envelop me. I searched for a familiar face, spotting Lisa across the room. She was chatting with a group, her laughter breaking the spell of darkness that had threatened to swallow me. As I approached her, I felt lighter, as though I had shed a heavy weight. The mansion was still eerie, but I no longer saw it as a haunting memory. It was a part of my history, yes, but it didn't have to dictate my future. Are you okay? Lisa asked, concern etched on her face as I reached her side. I smiled, the warmth of friendship grounding me. I am now, I replied, glancing back toward the staircase. The shadows still lingered, but I had faced them, and in doing so, I found a sense of freedom. The night stretched on, filled with laughter and stories. 
and I knew that whatever nightmares lay ahead, I had the strength to confront them. Story 9 The sunlight streamed through my bedroom window, casting a warm glow over the room. I stretched lazily, savoring the quiet of the morning. My mind was still foggy from sleep as I shuffled to the bathroom, ready to wash away the remnants of the night. The familiar routine was comforting, almost ritualistic, and I welcomed it like an old friend. As I stood in front of the mirror, splashing cold water on my face, I caught sight of my reflection. At first, everything appeared normal, a bleary-eyed figure with tousled hair and a groggy expression. But as I wiped the water away, I froze. My reflection didn't match my mood, it was smiling. A wide, unsettling grin spread across the face staring back at me, one that was not mirrored by my own. My heart raced, and I stumbled backward, nearly tripping over the edge of the sink. I blinked rapidly, convinced it was a trick of the light or a lingering effect of sleep, but the smile remained, perfectly unnatural. I leaned closer, my breath quickening. The reflection's eyes sparkled with an eerie joy, a stark contrast to my own fear and confusion. I opened my mouth to scream, but no sound emerged trapped in the pit of my throat. It felt as if the air around me thickened, making it hard to breathe. The grin only widened, and I felt a shiver run down my spine. What are you? I whispered, the words barely audible. The reflection tilted its head slightly, as if considering my question. It felt alive, and yet I knew it was just glass and light. Panic surged within me as I turned away, the thought of facing that smiling visage again filling me with dread. I hurried to my room, desperately searching for rational explanations. Had I woken up too suddenly? Was I still dreaming? I shook my head, trying to clear the fog. But every time I closed my eyes, I could see that smile, the way it stretched unnaturally across the face, an expression of pure glee. After pacing for a while, I returned to the bathroom, driven by a mix of fear and curiosity. Our reflection was still there, still smiling. I clenched my fists, determined not to show weakness. You're not real, I declared, glaring at the figure in the glass. The reflection's smile faltered momentarily, as if it were testing my resolve before returning to that unnerving grin. Frustrated, I grabbed my toothbrush, trying to focus on the mundane task at hand, but as I brushed my teeth, I couldn't help but sneak glances at the mirror. It felt like a game of chicken, testing who would crack first. I spat out the toothpaste and rinsed my mouth, determined to confront whatever this phenomenon was. Why are you smiling? I demanded, leaning closer to the glass. The reflection seemed to glow with delight, the grin widening impossibly. It didn't answer, of course, it couldn't. Yet, I felt a sense of urgency as if it were trying to communicate something I couldn't grasp. Suddenly, the reflection's expression shifted. The smile faded, replaced by a look of concern, as if it were trying to warn me. I blinked, startled by the change. Was it trying to convey a message? My heart pounded in my chest as I realized I might be losing my mind. What do you want? I asked, the tremor in my voice betraying my composure. In that moment, the smile returned, this time softer, almost sympathetic. It raised a hand, mirroring my movements. I hesitated, then reached out, pressing my palm against the cool surface of the glass. The reflection did the same, but when I looked closer, I could see faint lines of energy coursing through the surface like tiny sparks of electricity, and the connection felt surreal, and I hesitated. Are you trapped? I whispered, piecing together the fragments of my racing thoughts. The reflection nodded slowly, still maintaining that unnerving smile. A chill ran through me as I grappled with the implications of what I was seeing. What if this was a warning? Overwhelmed, I pulled away from the mirror, my heart racing. I stumbled back into my room, thoughts swirling in chaos. I needed to talk to someone anyone about what was happening. I dialed my best friend, Sarah, as I paced the floor, feeling the walls closing in. Hello, her groggy voice answered. Sarah, I need help. Something strange is happening with my reflection, I blurted out, urgency coloring my tone. What do you mean? She asked, concern lacing her voice. I saw my reflection smiling at me, and it wasn't me. It felt alive. My voice cracked as I recounted the morning's events, feeling increasingly frantic. Are you sure you're awake? She replied, trying to mask her laughter. Maybe you just need some coffee. No, I'm serious. It's not just my imagination. I pleaded desperation spilling into my words. I feel like something is wrong. 
Okay, okay. I'll come over, she said, her tone shifting to one of genuine concern. Just try to stay calm. I ended the call, but calm was the last thing I felt. I couldn't shake the memory of that smile or the feeling that something dark lingered just beneath the surface. What if it was more than just a reflection? When Sarah arrived, I led her to the bathroom, my heart pounding. Look, I urged, pointing at the mirror. But when she peered in, the smile was gone. My reflection stared back, looking as terrified as I felt. What's supposed to happen? Sarah asked, a frown creasing her forehead. I swear it was just there. I exclaimed, frustration bubbling over. It smiled at me. Maybe you're just overtired. You've been working too hard lately, she suggested gently. I felt a flicker of doubt creeping in, the fear I had experienced morphing into embarrassment. Maybe you're right, I sighed, rubbing my temples. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had shifted in me. That night, I lay awake. Unable to close my eyes, the events of the day replayed in my mind, and I wondered if I had truly seen what I thought I had. Was it a hallucination? Or was there something lurking just beyond my perception? As the hours dragged on, I finally fell into an uneasy sleep, only to be jolted awake by the sound of laughter. It was a soft, tinkling sound that echoed through the room. I shot up, heart racing, and glanced at the mirror. The reflection was there, staring back, but this time it was smiling broadly, almost playfully. What do you want from me? I shouted, voice trembling. The reflection's smile widened, and I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. In that moment, I realized it wasn't just a reflection, it was something else, something that fed off my fear and confusion. My heart pounded as I understood that the smile was not one of joy, but of something darker. It was taunting me, playing with my mind. I determined to break free from its grasp, I turned away from the mirror, pulling the blankets tightly around me. I would not let it win. As I lay in the darkness, I focused on my breathing, reminding myself that I was in control. I wouldn't let fear dictate my reality. The next morning, I approached the mirror with newfound resolve. The reflection awaited me, the smile still present, but I met its gaze with defiance. You don't own me, I declared, forcing strength into my voice. I'm not afraid of you. To my surprise, the reflection's smile faltered, and for a moment, uncertainty flickered across its face. I realized then that I had the power to redefine the narrative. I was not a passive observer in my own life, and I would not let my fears dictate my choices. With that realization, the reflection dissolved into the glass, leaving behind an empty surface. I felt a surge of relief, knowing that I had faced the darkness and emerged stronger. As I turned away, I knew I had reclaimed my story, no longer bound by the shadows that had sought to ensnare me. In the end, I learned that the true battle lay within, and as long as I held on to my strength, I would always prevail. Story 10 The old house creaked and groaned as the sun dipped below the horizon casting long shadows across the floorboards. I had moved in only a few months ago, excited to make this place my home. The basement, however, had always given me a sense of unease. It was dim and cluttered, filled with the remnants of the previous owner's life-forgotten furniture, dusty boxes, and a lingering mustiness that seemed to cling to the air. One evening, as I settled into the living room with a book, the laughter began. It was soft at first, like the tinkling of wind chimes, but it quickly morphed into the unmistakable sound of a child giggling. My heart raced, a mix of curiosity and dread bubbling up inside me. I glanced toward the basement door, which stood slightly ajar, the darkness beyond beckoning me. I hesitated, recalling the warnings from the neighbors about the house's history. They had mentioned strange occurrences, but I had brushed them off as old wives' tales. Yet, as the laughter echoed again, the sound tugged at something deep within me. I set my book down and rose from the couch, compelled to investigate. As I approached the basement door, the laughter faded into a soft whisper. I took a deep breath and pushed the door open, the rusty hinges creaking in protest. The darkness enveloped me like a thick fog, and I fumbled for the light switch, my hand trembling. The bulb flickered to life, casting a dim glow over the scattered items in the basement. Hello? I called, my voice sounding weak in the stillness. There was no response, just the echo of my words bouncing back at me. I stepped inside, scanning the room for any signs of movement. The laughter had vanished, replaced by an unsettling silence. 
I moved deeper into the basement, the wooden steps creaking beneath my weight. My eyes adjusted to the dim light, and I could make out shapes in the shadows a dusty old toy chest, a stack of cardboard boxes, and a forgotten rocking horse. Its paint chipped and faded, but there was no sign of anyone, no child to be found. Frustration began to bubble inside me. Had I imagined it, I shook my head, trying to dismiss the irrational thoughts creeping in. Just as I turned to leave, the laughter returned, clearer this time, ringing out like a bell. It was almost joyful, echoing off the walls and filling the basement with a sense of childlike wonder. I turned back, my heart pounding, driven by a mix of fear and intrigue. Is anyone there? I called out again, but the laughter stopped abruptly, leaving an eerie quiet in its wake. The silence stretched on, thick and suffocating. I was about to leave when I noticed a glimmer of light in the far corner of the basement. My curiosity peaked, I approached it cautiously. As I got closer, I realized it was coming from a small, cracked mirror leaning against the wall. The glass was dirty, but there was something enchanting about the way the light caught its edges. I leaned in, peering closely at my reflection. But my reflection wasn't alone. Behind me, I caught a glimpse of a small figure, barely visible in the shadows. I spun around, but again there was nothing, just the remnants of the past surrounding me. My heart raced, and a chill crept down my spine. Determined not to let fear consume me, I took a step back toward the mirror, half expecting to see the figure again. Instead, the only thing staring back was my own wide-eyed face. I shook my head, trying to clear the fog of confusion. You're losing it, I muttered under my breath. Just then, the laughter erupted once more, this time accompanied by the unmistakable sound of tiny footsteps scampering across the floor. Panic surged through me as I turned to the basement door, the only exit seeming to feel miles away. I bolted toward the stairs, but before I could reach them, the laughter transformed into a desperate cry. Help me. Shopin. The voice was unmistakably that of a child, filled with sorrow and urgency. I stopped dead in my tracks, torn between fleeing and investigating further. Where are you? I shouted, my voice wavering. Down here, the voice echoed, muffled and distant. I felt a magnetic pull toward the sound, a mix of fear and a desire to help. I took a step back, fighting against the instinct to run. What do you need? I called out, my voice trembling. Play with me. The words hung in the air, sweet yet haunting. Confusion clouded my thoughts. Who are you? I asked, hoping for some clarity in this bizarre situation. I'm lonely, the voice replied, tinged with sadness. I want to play. When I glanced around the basement, the shadows dancing in the corners as if something was watching me. My heart pounded in my chest. Where are you? I can't see you. Suddenly, the laughter returned, bright and airy, but it felt tainted now, as if it masked something darker. I realized that the joy in the laughter had morphed into something unsettling, a warning I couldn't quite understand. In a moment of panic, I stumbled backward, crashing into the rocking horse. The noise reverberated through the basement, and I felt a surge of adrenaline. I'm leaving, I yelled, backing away toward the stairs. Just as I turned to flee, the basement plunged into darkness. The light bulb flickered violently before going out completely, leaving me in a void. My heart raced as I fumbled for the railing, trying to find my way back. Then came the laughter again, now a cacophony of giggles mixed with sobs echoing all around me. It felt like it was closing in, drowning me in sound. I could no longer tell where the voice was coming from. It surrounded me, wrapping around my mind. Help me. It echoed and I felt the cold breath of something behind me. I bolted for the stairs, scrambling in the dark, adrenaline fueling my movements. I stumbled and nearly fell, but I pressed on, driven by an instinctual need to escape. As I reached the top, I flung the door open, crashing into the hallway beyond. Slamming the door shut behind me, I leaned against it, gasping for breath. The laughter faded, replaced by an oppressive silence. My heart raced, and I felt the sweat trickle down my back. I glanced back at the door, the darkness of the basement now a distant memory. But the echo of the laughter lingered in my mind, a haunting melody that would follow me long after I left that old house behind. I knew I couldn't go back to the basement, not yet. There was something trapped down there, something that called to me, and the thought of it both terrified and intrigued me. For now, I would have to confront that darkness another day.
Story 11 The accident happened on a rainy Thursday evening, the kind of night when the roads glisten cars slip unpredictably. I was driving home from work, my mind buzzing with the day's events, when suddenly headlights appeared out of nowhere. The impact was jarring, and in an instant everything changed. I remember the sound of shattering glass and the violent crunch of metal against metal. My heart raced as I stumbled out of the car, the rain pouring down, mingling with the shock that coursed through me. I approached the other vehicle, my breath hitching in my throat. There was a figure slumped over in the driver's seat, and it was clear that something was terribly wrong. The paramedics arrived quickly, and I was whisked away, shaken but unharmed. I learned later that the other driver, a young man named Alex, had died at the scene. He guilt gnawed at me as I processed the reality of what had happened. How could I have taken someone's life? Days turned into weeks, and while the physical wounds healed, the emotional scars remained. I began attending therapy sessions, trying to make sense of the chaos that had buckended my life. But just when I thought I might find some semblance of peace, the phone calls began. It started innocuously enough. One afternoon, my phone buzzed with an unknown number. I answered, expecting a telemarketer, but instead, a raspy voice whispered, you need to listen. My heart raced as confusion washed over me. Who is this? I asked, my voice trembling. The caller simply replied, I'm Alex. I hung up, my pulse pounding in my ears. It couldn't be, I had just buried Alex's memory deep within me, trying to move on. I ignored the call, but it happened again the next day and the day after that. Each time, the voice grew more insistent. You need to listen, it would say, always punctuated by that haunting phrase. I began to dread answering my phone, feeling an inexplicable pull towards the unknown. I confided in my therapist, who urged me to confront the fear rather than flee from it. It might be a manifestation of your guilt, she suggested. Sometimes our minds create ways to process trauma. But each call only deepened my anxiety. I wanted to be rational to dismiss it as a figment of my imagination, yet I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something sinister beneath the surface. The voice, though faint and raspy, felt achingly real. I decided to record the next call, hoping to gain some clarity. When I played it back, the chill in quality sent shivers down my spine. You need to listen, it echoed, accompanied by static that made it sound as if the line were struggling to connect. That evening, I decided to investigate. I contacted the local police department to see if they had any leads on the number. They couldn't trace it, which only added to my dread. A few days later, I received another call, and this time I steeled myself. What do you want? I demanded, my voice steady, despite the fear coursing through me. The silence on the other end was deafening before the voice finally responded. I need you to understand. It wasn't your fault. The word struck me like a lightning bolt. What do you mean? I asked, my heart racing as I wrestled with the implications. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time, Alex's voice said. But you have to forgive yourself. Tears pricked at my eyes, a mix of relief and confusion swirling within me. Was this really Alex reaching out from beyond the grave? I wanted to believe it, to feel absolved from the crushing guilt. How can I forgive myself? I choked out. You're dead because of me. Listen, he said, his tone softening. There are things you need to know. I wasn't just a driver. I was on my way to something important. But it's not your fault. Life is unpredictable. You can't carry this weight forever. His words resonated deep within me, and I felt the walls I had built around my heart begin to crack. But before I could respond, the call ended abruptly, leaving me alone in my room, the silence deafening. I spent the next few days in the haze, oscillating between hope and despair. I felt compelled to reach out to Alex's family, but fear held me back. Well, what would I say? Would they blame me? The thought of facing them paralyzed me, yet I felt an overwhelming need to honor his memory somehow. Then, one evening, as I sat in my living room, the phone rang again. I took a deep breath and answered, Alex, I said, my heart pounding. What do you want me to do? The voice returned, steady and calm. Tell them my story. Help them understand that I lived and I loved. It's time for you to let go. I nodded, though he couldn't see me. How can I do that? I asked. They need to know I didn't die in vain. Share your journey, your struggles, and how my death affected you. Help them heal. I felt an overwhelming urge to honor his wishes. 
I decided to attend the next support group for families of victims prepared to speak my truth. Oh. In the next meeting felt monumental. I stood before a group of grieving families, trembling but resolute. I shared my story, my fears, and my guilt. I spoke of Alex as a person, not just a statistic. When I finished, I looked up to see tears in the audience, some nodding in understanding. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders, as if Alex were beside me, reassuring me. The experience was cathartic, both for me and for those in the room. The calls continued, but their tone shifted. Instead of a plea, they became affirmations. And you're doing well, he would say, and I felt a sense of connection that extended the boundaries of life and death. It became clear that these calls were not just about guilt, they were about helling for both of us. As weeks passed, the calls slowly dwindled until they ceased altogether. I found peace in the silence, knowing that I had honored Alex's memory. I continued to share his story, helping others who were grieving and processing loss. The experience changed me, allowing me to move forward, carrying his memory in my heart without the heavy burden of guilt. In the end, I learned that even the most tragic events could lead to healing and understanding, bridging the gap between life and death in unexpected ways. Alex's voice had guided me, teaching me that forgiveness, whether for myself or for others, was the ultimate gift we could give to those we lost. Story 12 While sorting through the attic of my newly purchased home, I stumbled upon an old, dust-covered box tucked in the corner. The box was an assuming, but my curiosity got the better of me. I pried it open to find a collection of faded photographs, trinkets, and at the bottom, a leather-bound journal. Its spine was cracked and the pages were yellowed, whispering of secrets long kept. I pulled it out, feeling a connection to the past as I brushed off the dust. The journal belonged to a woman named Margaret who had lived in my house decades ago. We would as I flipped through the pages, I was immediately drawn in by her eloquent handwriting and vivid descriptions of daily life. Her entries were intimate, detailing everything from mundane chores to her dreams and heart touches. The first entry I read was dated June 3, 1954. Today I planted daisies in the garden. They remind me of summer days spent with my mother. I wish she could see this place. I smiled at the simplicity of her words, a snapshot of a life that felt both foreign and familiar. I continued reading, and with each entry I became more engrossed in her world. The days turned into nights as I dove deeper into Margaret's life. I learned about her struggles, her friendships, and the joys that filled her days. And she wrote about a love she found in a local cafe, a man named Thomas, whose charm swept her off her feet. I felt a pang of longing as I read about their whirlwind romance, a feeling that echoed my own experiences in recent, recent months. But it wasn't just her joys that resonated with me, it was the shadows too. I found an entry from August 12th, 1954, I've been feeling lost lately. The expectations weigh heavy on my heart. I wonder if I'll ever find my purpose. As I read those words, chills ran down my spine. Just days ago, I had confided in my best friend about feeling similarly adrift in my career. The more I read, the more I felt connected to Margaret. Her thoughts mirrored my own in uncanny ways. She wrote about her struggles with anxiety, her desire to create art, and the feeling of being trapped in a world that didn't understand her. I had always thought my struggles were unique, but there they were, laid bare on the pages of this journal. One night, I sat on the floor of my living room, the soft glow of a lamp illuminating the journal, as I read the final entry dated September 29th, 1954. Today, I finally painted again. The colors felt like freedom, like an escape from my worries. I hope one day someone will find this journal and understand my journey. I closed the journal, my heart heavy. I felt as though I had been entrusted with a sacred part of her life, but it was also a jarring reminder of my own unfulfilled dreams. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling that Margaret's spirit lingered in the house, her presence woven into its very fabric. As I lay in bed, I considered her life and what it meant for mine. I realized that I had been so focused on the expectations of others that I had lost sight of my own passions and desires. The next day, I decided to take a leap. Inspired by Margaret's final words, I set out to reclaim my creativity. I dusted off my old canvas and brushes, determined to paint again. With each stroke, I felt liberated, as if I were channeling the energy and dreams of the woman who once inhabited this space. The colors flowed freely, 
vibrant and unapologetic. Over the next few weeks, I poured myself into my art, creating pieces that reflected my emotions and experiences. It was therapeutic, a journey of self-discovery that I had long neglected. Margaret's journal had ignited a spark within me, a reminder of the importance of pursuing one's passion despite the noise of the world. But as I painted, something strange began to happen. I noticed that my entries in my own journal, which I had kept for years, started to reflect Margaret's themes more closely. I wrote about my garden, the daisies I had planted, and how they reminded me of my own mother. I expressed my feelings of inadequacy and the desire to find my purpose, just as she had. One evening, as I mixed paint on my palette, I paused and stared at a canvas that had begun to take shape. The image was eerily similar to one Margaret had described in her journal a sunset over a garden filled with daisies. I felt an inexplicable connection to her, as though our lives were intertwined across time. As days turned into weeks, I found comfort in this strange connection. I began to explore more of Margaret's life, visiting local libraries to uncover more about her. I discovered that she had been a local artist, known for her vibrant depictions of nature. Her works had once filled galleries, but her name had faded from memory. Determined to honor her legacy, I decided to host a small exhibition featuring my own art inspired by her life. I spent hours preparing, pouring my heart into each piece while reflecting on Margaret's journey. The night of the exhibition, I hung her journal beside my paintings, hoping to share her story alongside my own. As guests arrived, I felt a mix of excitement and nervousness. I spoke about Margaret, her struggles, and how her words had impacted my life. When people looked at my paintings, I saw the recognition in their eyes, a shared understanding of the complexities of life, love, and art. At the end of the night, an older woman approached me. Tears glistened in her eyes as she introduced herself as Margaret's niece. I've been searching for my aunt's art for years, she said, her voice trembling. I had no idea her journal had survived. Thank you for bringing her story back to life. In that moment, I felt a profound sense of connection both to Margaret and to the legacy of those who had come before us. I realized that the threads of our lives are woven together in ways we might never fully understand. Through her words, Margaret had inspired me to reclaim my voice, and now I was helping her story live on. As I stood there, surrounded by her memory, I felt a sense of peace settle over me. I knew that Margaret and I were kindred spirits, bound by the shared experiences of longing and creativity, and I vowed to honor both our journeys, living authentically and passionately, just as she had dreamed. Story 13 The moment I stepped into my new apartment, a mix of excitement and unease washed over me. The place was old, with creaking floorboards and walls that had seen better days. Still, the charm of vintage fixtures and high ceilings drew me in. As I began unpacking boxes, I couldn't shake the feeling that the apartment held secrets. Whispers of lives lived long before mine. On a rainy afternoon, I stumbled across an unusual wooden door tucked away behind a faded tapestry in the hallway. It was small and unassuming, nearly blending into the wall. My curiosity peaked. I brushed aside the fabric, revealing a tarnished doorknob. Hesitating for a moment, I turned it slowly, feeling a chill skitter up my spine as the door creaked open. Inside was a room unlike anything I had expected. The air was stale, filled with the scent of dust and something oddly sweet. It was dimly lit, the only source of light filtering through a small, grimy window. As my eyes adjusted, I was met with a collection of strange and disturbing items, each telling a story I wasn't sure I wanted to know. In the corner, an old trunk sat half open, overflowing with yellowed newspapers and tattered photographs. I approached cautiously, my heart racing. The photographs were black and white, depicting families long forgotten, their expressions a mix of joy and despair. One caught my eye a group of children playing in a field, their laughter frozen in time. I felt a pang of nostalgia, but it quickly faded as I noticed a handwritten note tucked beneath the peel. Remember us, it read, scrawled in shaky handwriting. My skin prickled. Who had left this note, and why? I moved deeper into the room, discovering shelves lined with peculiar items, broken dolls with missing eyes, a cracked mirror reflecting my startled face and jars filled with murky liquids, their contents unidentifiable. And each object seemed to pulse with a heavy history, as if they were remnants of past tenants who had left pieces of themselves behind. In the center of the room stood a rickety table, 
its surface cluttered with strange trinkets, dried flowers, rusted keys, and what appeared to be a small wooden figure, intricately carved. I picked it up, examining it closely. It resembled a woman, her expression hauntingly sorrowful. As I turned it over, I noticed something engraved on the base, for those who have lost their way. The room felt suffocating, as if it were alive with memories that didn't belong to me. I stepped back, taking a deep breath, and turned my attention to the walls. They were covered in faded wallpaper, but upon closer inspection, I saw words scratched into the surface names, dates, and what looked at desperate pleas. Help me, one read. Another said, I can't escape. My stomach churned. I felt as though I had intruded into a place of grief and anguish, a sanctuary for lost souls. I stumbled back toward the door, my heart racing. I had come seeking adventure, but what I found was a chilling reminder of the burdens carried by those before me. Just as I reached for the doorknob, something caught my eye, a small, ornate box perched on a shelf above the table. Compelled by an inexplicable force, I climbed onto a chair to retrieve it. The box was beautifully crafted, adorned with delicate carvings of vines and flowers. I carefully opened it, revealing a collection of letters tied together with fraying string. They were addressed to someone named Clara, written in a flowing script that felt oddly familiar. As I read the first letter, I realized it was a correspondence between Clara and someone named Edward. Their words spoke of love, longing, and a shared dream to escape the confines of their lives. With each letter, the tone shifted, growing darker and more desperate. Clara's letters became filled with anxiety, mentioning shadows lurking in corners and voices echoing through the halls. Edward, I fear something is watching me, one letter concluded. I can't shake the feeling that I am not alone in this place. My heart raced as I finished reading. What had happened to Clara? Had she been the last tenant in this apartment, consumed by whatever darkness lingered here? Feeling a mix of dread and determination, I knew I had to uncover the truth. I spent the next few days researching the apartment's history. I learned that it had been built in the early 1900s, housing numerous families over the decades. Each had its own tale, some of joy, others steeped in tragedy. The most recent tenant, Clara, had disappeared under mysterious circumstances, and no one had seen her since. The weight of her story hung heavy in my heart as I returned to the secret room. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was somehow connected to her. Determined to find answers, I decided to spend the night in that room, hoping to communicate with whatever presence lingered. As darkness enveloped the apartment, I set up a small lamp and placed the letters around me. I felt an electric charge in the air, a sense of anticipation mixed with fear. I closed my eyes, willing Clara to reach out to me. Hours passed, and I felt the silence wrap around me like a shroud, just as I was about to give in to exhaustion. A soft whisper brushed against my ear. Help me. Ah. My eyes shot open, heart pounding. I glanced around, but the room was still. Taking a deep breath, I called out, Clara, I'm here. I want to help you. What do you need? The air grew colder, and the shadows in the corner seemed to shift. A figure appeared, flickering in and out of focus. It was a woman, her features faint but familiar, her eyes filled with a sorrow that pierced my heart. Find me, she whispered, her voice barely audible. I'm trapped here. With that, the figure vanished, leaving me alone in the room. My mind raced. How could I help her? I felt an overwhelming need to uncover the truth behind her disappearance. The next day, I began digging deeper into the building's history, seeking records, speaking with neighbors, and visiting the local library. Each new piece of information led me closer to understanding Clara's fate. I discovered that Clara had been involved with a group of tenants who believed the apartment held dark energies. They performed rituals, trying to communicate with spirits, unaware of the dangers they invited in. The last ritual had gone awry, leading to Clara's disappearance. Determined to free her spirit, I returned to the secret room one final time, armed with what I had learned. I lit candles and placed them around the letters, creating a circle of light. With trembling hands, I recited an invocation I had found in my research, hoping to connect with Clara. Story 14 Ugh. 
It started on a quiet Wednesday evening, the kind of night when the world outside faded into a dull hum and the only sounds came from the soft flicker of the television. I settled onto the couch, my dog Max curled up at my feet, his eyes drooping as he began to doze off. Just as I sank into the comfort of my favorite show, Max suddenly bolted upright, barking furiously at the corner of the living room. Max, what's wrong? I asked, startled by his sudden outburst. He seemed fixated, his tail stiff and ears perked, growling low in his throat. I followed his gaze, but the corner remained empty, the shadows dancing eerily in the dim light. I brushed it off as an overactive imagination, maybe a shadow playing tricks on him. But as the days went on, it became a nightly ritual. Each time I would sit down to relax, Max would bark and growl at that same corner. The tension in his posture and the intensity in his gaze made my skin crawl. It was as if something unseen was lurking just out of sight. I tried to reassure him, patting his head and speaking softly, but his anxiety only heightened. One evening, feeling increasingly uneasy, I decided to investigate. I moved closer to the corner, squinting into the shadows. There's nothing here, buddy, I said, but Max continued to bark, his gaze unwavering. I rummaged through the nearby shelves, looking for anything that could have caught his attention a misplaced toy. A loose curtain yet found nothing. At night I went to bed with an unsettling feeling gnawing at my gut. As I lay in the dark I couldn't shake the sensation that I was being watched. The air felt heavy oppressive, almost charged with something I couldn't define. Max slept soundly beside me but I tossed and turned, unable to escape the unease that wrapped around me like a shroud. Days turned into weeks, and the barking grew more frequent, accompanied by a chilling draft that swept through the living room. I began to feel that I wasn't alone in the house, that something was there with us. It wasn't just Max's behavior, it was the way the air felt different, the way the light flickered occasionally as if it were being disturbed by an unseen presence. One evening I was sitting on the couch, trying to concentrate on a book when I felt a sudden chill that sent shivers down my spine. Max sat at my feet, staring into the corner, his growls rising in pitch. I set the book down and focused on my heart nascent, my heart racing. The atmosphere felt charged, and I held my breath, waiting for something to happen. Then, I felt it a shift in the air, like a cool breeze brushing against my skin. Even though the windows were closed, he turned to look and in that moment the room felt heavier, as if it had come alive with an energy that made my skin prickle. My instinct screamed at me to leave, but I stayed rooted to the spot, a morbid curiosity taking hold. Is someone there? I whispered, my voice trembling. Silence enveloped me, but Max whimpered softly, pressing closer to my legs. I leaned forward, trying to peer into the darkness, but I saw nothing. The tension in the air grew thick, almost suffocating, and I felt a presence lurking just beyond my line of sight. That night, I scoured the internet, researching potential explanations for Max's behavior. I stumbled upon countless stories about pet-sensing spirits, tales of animals alerting their owners to things unseen. The more I read, the more the chilling stories resonated with my experience. I found myself wondering what could be haunting my home and why it had chosen to reveal itself in such an unsettling manner. The next day, determined to confront whatever was watching me, I decided to stage a sort of seance. I gathered candles and a few items that held personal significance family photographs, Mentos and even Max's favorite toy. I thought perhaps a welcoming gesture would invite whatever spirit lingered in the corner to reveal itself. That evening, I lit the candles and sat on the floor. Max by my side, his body tense but quiet. If there's someone here, I said softly, I mean no harm. I just want to understand. As I spoke, the air thickened once more, and I felt that familiar chill enveloping the room. I closed my eyes, focusing on the presence. Can you give me a sign? Suddenly, a flicker of light caught my attention. I opened my eyes to see the flames of the candles wavering violently, as if caught in a sudden gust. My heart raced as I glanced around but the windows remained shut. Max let out a low growl, his body tense as he watched the corner. Please, if you're here, show me, I urged, my voice shaking slightly. In response, a faint whisper danced through the air, barely audible yet hauntingly clear, and help me. I froze, every hair on my body standing on end. My heart pounded in my chest. I looked down at Max, whose eyes were wide, darting between me and the corner. What do you need? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. 
but the room remained silent save for the soft crackling of the candles. The air felt heavy with expectation, but I didn't know how to proceed. If you're trapped, I can help you. Just tell me what to do. The flickering light steadied, and for a moment, I thought I saw a shape in the corner, a fleeting shadow that sent a jolt of fear through me. I wanted to run, but the weight of that plea held me in place. Days turned into a blur of restless nights and fearful moments. The feeling of being watched became a constant companion, and I found myself hesitant to be alone in the house. Each time Max would bark, I felt a knot of dread tightening in my stomach. Then one night, I decided to confront the darkness once and for all. Armed with my phone's flashlight, I ventured into the corner, where Max always focused his attention. I'm not afraid of you, I said, my voice steadier than I felt. I want to help you. As I scanned the area, my flashlight beam illuminated the dust motes swirling in the air. Suddenly, Max barked again, but this time it was different. His barking turned into a whimper, as if he sensed something even I couldn't see. Enough. I shouted, frustration bubbling over. If you're here, show yourself. In that moment, the temperature dropped dramatically, and I felt a breath on my neck, cold and eye nest settling. I spun around, but the room was empty. The shadows deepened, and I felt an overwhelming sadness wash over me. Please, if you need help, let me know, I pleaded, my voice breaking. Max whimpered softly, nudging against my leg. Then, I felt it a presence, heavy and sorrowful, settling around me. I closed my eyes, fighting the urge to flee. What do you want from me? A soft sigh filled the air, and I felt the energy shift. The sadness coiled around me, and for a moment I understood. It wasn't anger or malice, it was a plea for help, an echo of something unresolved. Story 15 It started as an ordinary Tuesday. I was sitting at my desk, sipping coffee and scrolling through my emails when one caught my attention. On the subject line read, Your Life Story. Curiosity peak, I clicked it open. The message was from a ghostwriter who claimed they were crafting a narrative about my life. At first I thought it was some kind of spam, but as I read through the email, a chill settled in my stomach. The writer detailed moments from my childhood that only a handful of people knew. They described my first day at school, the nervousness that gripped me, and the small teddy bear I clutched tightly for comfort. They wrote about my family, my relationship with my parents, and even my struggles in high school. I was taken aback. It was as if someone had been shadowing me for years. Skepticism coursed through me. How could a stranger know these intimate details? I brushed it off, telling myself it was just a coincidence, but as I continued reading, unease crept in. A writer revealed plans for a book that would encapsulate not just my memories, but also my fears, dreams, and regrets. It felt invasive, as if they were peering into my soul. The email ended with an invitation to discuss the project further. A link was included, leading to a scheduling app where I could book a time to chat. I hesitated. What if this was some elaborate scam? Yet the accuracy of the details gnawed at me. Against my better judgment, I clicked on the link and scheduled a call. The day of the call arrived and I sat nervously at my desk, the phone vibrating in my hand. When I answered, I was met with the sound of static before a voice emerged, calm and steady. Hello, it's nice to finally connect. The voice was familiar yet unsettling. Who are you? I asked, my voice wavering. I'm your ghostwriter, they replied. I've been following your story closely. Following? What do you mean? Researching. You have a fascinating life, full of rich experiences. I want to help you share it. I felt a cold sweat forming on my brow. You can't just invade my life like this. It's not right. I'm not invading. I'm illuminating they countered their tone soothing, but I need to know more. There's still so much you haven't revealed. What do you want from me? I demanded, feeling cornered. Just your trust, they replied. Let me in and I promise to help you tell your story. I hung up, my heart racing. The conversation left me rattled and I spent the rest of the day pacing around my apartment, trying to shake off the feeling of being watched. That evening, I decided to investigate. I searched online for the name associated with the email but found nothing, no website, no social media presence. It was as if this ghostwriter had materialized out of thin air. The next morning I received another email. 
This time, it contained a detailed account of my recent trip to Italy, my favorite spots, the food I savored, even the cafe where I had met an old friend. I hadn't shared any of this online, and I felt the hair on my neck stand on end. It was unnerving, but I couldn't help but feel an odd thrill. What if this was a way to finally tell my story, to delve into the moments I had kept hidden? That night, unable to sleep, I decided to respond. I wrote a brief message sharing some thoughts about my life, both the good and the bad, all the while wrestling with the urge to cut ties completely. I pressed send, and my heart raced as I waited for a reply. The next morning, a response came almost immediately. The writer praised my honesty and requested a meeting to discuss more personal topics, my fears, my regrets. I felt an odd sense of vulnerability. Reluctantly, I agreed to another call. When we connected, the atmosphere was thick with tension. Thank you for trusting me, the ghostwriter said. I can sense that you've been holding back. What do you mean? I asked, feeling exposed. Your struggles with anxiety, your fear of failure, these are critical elements in your narrative. narrative. They shape who you are. My breath caught in my throat. How could they know this? I hesitated, unsure of how to respond. That's personal, I managed, my voice barely a whisper. Exactly. And that's why your story will resonate. But I need more details, they urged, their voice a blend of coaxing and insistence. As days turned into weeks, I found myself entangled in the writer's web. I began to share snippets of my life, recounting painful memories I had long buried. With each call, the ghostwriter became more adept at drawing out my emotions, and I felt a strange bond forming. I wanted to believe they were on my side, helping me transform my experiences into something powerful. But the feeling of dread never fully faded. I began to notice small oddities around my apartment I more of a feeling of being watched. I brushed it off as paranoia, but the sensation persisted. I grew increasingly uneasy, torn between the catharsis of sharing my story and the invasive nature of it all. Then one afternoon I received a package at my door. It was a small, nondescript box with no return address. Inside, I found a collection of photographs, images of my childhood, of family gatherings, and even candid shots from my daily life. It felt like an invasion, a direct violation of my privacy. I scrambled to call the ghostwriter, heart pounding. What is this? How did you get these, these bengai? It's all part of your story, they replied, calm and collected. These moments define you. No, this isn't right. You need to stop. Have you thought about the impact of your story? They countered, undeterred. People need to hear it. You need to share it. In a fit of panic, I hung up and decided enough was enough. I needed to reclaim my life, to sever ties with this person who had wormed their way into my mind. That evening, I drafted one last email, declaring my intent to end all communication. As I typed, the lights in my apartment flickered, casting strange shadows across the room. I dismissed it as a power surge and pressed send, feeling a weight lift from my shoulders. But as I turned to pour myself a glass of water, I caught a glimpse of movement from the corner of my eye. My heart sank. There, in the reflection of the darkened window, I saw a figure standing just outside. I turned, but there was nothing there. My pulse raced as I approached the window, peering into the darkness. The street was empty, yet a sense of dread settled in my chest. That night, I locked every door and window, fearing the unseen force that had invaded my life. I tried to convince myself it was all in my head, a culmination of anxiety and stress. But sleep eluded me, and the ghostwriter's voice echoed in my mind. Days passed, and I stayed on high alert, wary of every creak and rustle in my apartment. Then, without warning, I received a final email. The subject line read, Your true story awaits. With trembling hands, I opened it. The message was chilling. The ghostwriter claimed they had made significant progress on my life story, revealing even more intimate details. But the last line sent shivers down my spine. You will find your true self by embracing your destiny, and I will be there to guide you. The finality of their words filled me with terror. I had unwittingly stepped into a trap, one that blurred the lines between my reality and their narrative. The urge to escape became overwhelming. In a moment of clarity, I realized I had to confront this once and for all. I grabbed my phone and dialed the local police, explaining the situation in a rush. They assured me they would investigate but warned that it might take time. That night, I decided to take control. 
I drafted a final response, setting boundaries and asserting my autonomy. I typed furiously, pouring my defiance into every word. With one last glance at the screen, I pressed send and waited. And suddenly my phone buzzed with an incoming call. It was an unknown number. Against my better judgment, I answered. The voice on the other end was chillingly familiar. You can't run from your story. It's who you are. Panic surged through me, but I steeled myself. I'm not afraid of you. You don't own my life. A laugh echoed on the line, cold and mocking. You may think you can escape, but your story is already written. I will always be a part of it. Ain. With a surge of adrenaline, I hung up and grabbed my keys. I had to leave. As I rushed out, I felt the weight of the past lifting, the shadows receding. I would find a way to reclaim my narrative and put an end to this nightmare. Story 16 The garage had always been a chaotic mix of forgotten items, old tools, dusty boxes, and remnants of my childhood that I had never quite managed to throw away. One rainy afternoon, with nothing else to occupy my time, I decided to tackle the mess. As I sifted through the clutter, I felt a sense of nostalgia mingled with the heaviness of years gone by. That's when I noticed them three locked boxes, pushed far back in a the corner, their surfaces marred with age and dust. Curiosity peak, I wiped off the grime and examined the boxes more closely. They were plain and unassuming, crafted from sturdy wood and secured with rusted padlocks. I felt a chill as I studied the intricate carvings on each box they depicted scenes of nature intertwined with strange, almost eerie motives. An unsettling feeling crept over me, urging me to leave them untouched, but I couldn't shake the urge to find out what lay inside. With a sense of determination, I scoured the garage for tools. I finally found a pair of bolt cutters, their blades gleaming ominously. It felt wrong to break the locks, but something inside me whispered that I needed to know. With a swift motion, I severed the first padlock, the sound echoing in the silent garage. My heart raced as I lifted the lid, revealing the contents within. The first box held an assortment of items, seemingly random yet charged with an unsettling energy. A cracked photo frame contained a faded picture of a young girl with bright eyes and a wide smile. Next to it lay a tattered teddy bear, its fur worn and discolored. Beneath these mementos was a small diary, its pages yellowed with age. I opened it cautiously, feeling a wave of sadness wash over me as I began to read. The entries spoke of a girl named Lily who had vanished from our neighborhood years ago, and she wrote of her dreams and her fears, recounting the last day she was seen. Her words were haunting, filled with a sense of innocence and longing. I could almost hear her voice in my head, echoing through the years, begging for someone to remember her. As I closed the diary, the weight of its history settled on me. I felt compelled to find out more about Lily's disappearance. What had happened to her? Why was her memory buried in my garage, sealed away in this box? Shaking off the lingering melancholy, I turned my attention to the second box, my heart pounding with anticipation. I removed the lock with a satisfying snap and opened it slowly. Inside lay a collection of postcards, each one depicting various locations around the town. But what caught my attention was the name scrawled in neat handwriting on the back of each card, Emma. The cards were dated, the last one postmarked just days before her disappearance. Emma's story was another heartbreaking chapter in our neighborhood's history. Each postcard bore messages filled with joy and excitement she described the places she visited and the friends she made. Yet the final card, written in a rushed scrawl, hinted at something darker, I'm scared. Someone is watching me. I felt a shiver run down my spine as I realized the gravity of her words. The postcards, once a means of connection, now felt like desperate cries for help. I couldn't help but wonder if these locked boxes contained more than just mementos. Were they tokens of lost souls, remnants of lives interrupted by tragedy? The thought chilled me, yet I was determined to uncover the truth. I hesitated only briefly before moving on to the third box. The lock fell away with ease, revealing a different kind of horror. Inside were pieces of clothing, small shoes, a jacket, and a hat. Each item was worn and stained, 
bearing the marks of time. Among them lay a small wooden box, intricately carved and tightly closed. I opened it cautiously, revealing a single piece of jewelry, a delicate silver locket. The locket was engraved with the initials AB, and contained a tiny faded photograph of a girl who looked eerily familiar. As I held it in my hands, a sense of recognition washed over me. I recalled a missing persons report from years ago, Abigail, a girl who had disappeared without a trace. Her case had haunted the neighborhood, and her name was spoken in hushed tones. The locket felt heavy with the weight of her story, as if it were a physical manifestation of the loss the community had endured. I stood in the dim light of the garage, surrounded by the echoes of lives interrupted, feeling an overwhelming sense of responsibility. These boxes held not just forgotten objects, but the stories of individuals who had vanished, their fates woven into the fabric of our neighborhood. I felt a stirring within me a desire to give these souls the recognition they deserved. And determined to honor their memories, I took pictures of the items documenting everything I had discovered. I resolved to visit the local historical society and share what I had found. Perhaps I could help shed light on these cold cases, breathing life back into the stories of Lily, Emma, and Abigail. As I closed the boxes and stepped out of the garage, a sense of purpose filled me. I was no longer just a bystander in my own life. I was now a steward of their memories, committed to unearthing the truth that had long been buried in silence. The chilling mementos were not merely remnants of the past they were calls to action, urging me to seek justice and remembrance for those who had been lost. Story 17 It started innocently enough. One rainy Tuesday, as I settled into my desk at the office, I noticed a small package wrapped in brown paper sitting next to my computer. There was no note attached, just a single white ribbon tied neatly around it. I glanced around, puzzled. Who would leave a gift for me? I. Curiosity peaked. I unwrapped it, revealing a vintage music box. It was beautifully crafted, adorned with intricate carvings. As I wound it up, a soft, haunting melody filled the air. It was enchanting, yet something about it tugged at the corners of my memory. A vague sense of nostalgia I couldn't quite place. Later that day, I received an anonymous message on my phone, remember the song. It was our favorite. A chill ran down my spine. I didn't recall sharing a favorite song with anyone. I shrugged it off, convincing myself it was just a harmless prank. The next day, another package appeared on my desk. This time it was an old photograph, black and white, depicting a group of children playing in a park. My heart raced as I scanned the faces, searching for any sign of familiarity. One girl stood out, her hair and pigtails, her smile bright. I had no memory of her, yet an inexplicable connection pulled at me. That same day, I received another message. She was your best friend. Don't you remember? I felt a knot tightening in my stomach. I had no recollection of a best friend from my childhood, and it was as if someone was picking at the scabs of memories I had long buried. Over the following weeks, the gifts kept coming. Each time I found something that sparked a flicker of recognition, an old book filled with notes in the margins, a charm bracelet with a single missing bead, and finally, a worn out diary filled with entries that felt too intimate, too personal. Each accompanying message was cryptic, teasing the edges of memories I struggled to grasp. You loved the stories, read one note, referring to the diary. I had no recollection of the stories, but the handwriting felt strangely familiar like a distant echo from the past. With every gift, my unease deepened. I became consumed by the mystery, spending my evenings poring over the items, trying to unlock the secrets buried within them. The music box would play the same haunting tune, and I would close my eyes, desperate to remember the moments that accompanied it. The photograph began to feel like a haunting specter in my mind, the girl's face a riddle I couldn't solve. I confided in my friend Clara, who had been my confidant through thick and thin. This is all so bizarre, I said, tossing the diary onto the coffee table. Someone is playing games with my past. Or maybe it's someone from your childhood trying to reconnect, she suggested, though her brow furrowed in concern. Have you thought about reaching out to your family? They might remember things you've forgotten. The idea sparked a flicker of hope. I decided to call my mother that evening. 
As she answered, I could hear the warmth in her voice, but when I mentioned the gifts, her tone shifted. Honey, what kind of gifts? After I described them, she grew silent. Those sound like things from your childhood, but why would someone send them to you now? I don't know, Mom. It feels like someone is trying to dig up old memories, and I don't know why I admitted the weight of anxiety pressing on my chest. We all have things we bury, dear. Sometimes it's better to let the past stay buried, she replied, her voice tinged with a warning I couldn't fully understand. I didn't heed her advice. The next gift arrived on a Friday, a small wooden box, intricately carved with symbols I didn't recognize. Inside was a locket, old and tarnished. As I opened it, I found a faded photograph of the same girl from the park photo. The resemblance was uncanny, they could be twins. Beneath it, a note read, you promised you would always keep me close. Tears pricked at my eyes. The note felt like a dagger, cutting through the fog of forgetfulness that surrounded me. I felt a mixture of fear and determination. I needed answers. That night I sat on my bed, surrounded by the growing pile of gifts. I picked up the diary again, flipping through its pages, looking for clues. It detailed summer days filled with laughter, secrets shared under the shade of trees and a friendship that had apparently meant the world to me. The last entry abruptly ended, filled with an ink blot that seemed to bleed across the page. I lay back against the pillows, letting the memories wash over me. I could almost hear the laughter of children, the sound of running feet across grass. The girl's face danced just beyond the veil of my mind, tantalizingly close yet frustratingly out of reach. As the clock struck midnight, my phone buzzed with another message. You need to remember, it's time to confront the past. My heart racing, I glanced at the screen, uncertainty flooding through me. I was teetering on the edge of something profound, a truth waiting to unfurl. The next day, I returned to the park depicted in the photograph. It was eerily quiet, the air thick with memories that lay dormant beneath the surface. I wandered the paths, hoping to jog some recognition, a flash of familiarity. Suddenly, I spotted a swing set. Approaching it, I felt a rush of emotions. I could almost hear the laughter echoing, feel the weight of a tiny body swinging next to me. As I sat on one of the swings, the world around me faded, and a vision began to unfold. I saw myself younger and carefree, flying through the air alongside the girl from the photographs. We were inseparable, two souls entwined in laughter and secrets. Then, the vision shifted, darkening abruptly. I saw shadows, figures standing around, and the girl's face twisted in fear. With a jolt, I snapped back to reality, breathless and shaken. It hit me like a wave, she was gone. Whatever had happened to us had split my memories in two, forcing me to forget. I realized the gifts were a way to pull me back into the light, to reclaim the friendship that had been stolen from me. I needed to confront the shadows of my past. I pulled out my phone, trembling as I typed a response. I'm ready to remember. I didn't know what lay ahead, but I was prepared to face the darkness and uncover the truth of my buried secrets, to find the girl I had lost, and finally understand why. The journey would be difficult, but I was determined to reclaim my past, piece by piece, memory by memory. Story 18 My elderly neighbor, Mrs. Harrington, always had a way of drawing my attention with her peculiar warnings. I'd often see her sitting on her porch, her gnarled hands knitting and her sharp eyes scanning the street. One evening, as I was returning from work, she beckoned me over with an urgency that made me pause. I don't open the curtains at night, she said, her voice trembling slightly. You don't know what you might see. At first, I laughed it off as just another one of her quirky superstitions. The old woman had lived in our neighborhood for decades and had a penchant for dramatic tales. It's just a matter of privacy, Mrs. Harrington, I joked. She shook her head, her expression serious. No, dear. There are things out there that shouldn't be seen. Trust me. That night, her warning lingered in my mind as I settled into my living room. The city was quiet. The soft hum of traffic barely audible. I tried to focus on my book, but the thought of those curtains tugged to cut my curiosity. What could possibly be lurking outside? Surely it was just the darkened street and the flickering lampposts. As the clock struck ten, the urge to pull back the curtains became unbearable. 
I reasoned that I was being silly, succumbing to fear rather than logic. I stood up, crossed the room, and grasped the curtain fabric, pulling it aside to reveal the outside world. At first, nothing seemed amiss. The street lay in shadows, and the cool night air whispered against the glass, but as I peered deeper, my heart raced. A figure stood at the end of the block, just beyond the light of the street lamp. The silhouette was vague, almost indistinct, but I could make out a tall, thin shape, its features obscured by the darkness. I squinted, trying to discern its identity, but as I did, the figure seemed to shift, moving closer to the light. I froze, holding my breath as it emerged from the shadows. It was a man, dressed in a long coat that flapped gently in the breeze. He raised his head slightly, and I felt a chill sweep through me as I caught a glimpse of his face. It was pale, almost ghostly, with hollow eyes that seemed to bore into my soul. My heart raced as I dropped the curtain, an instinctual reaction to hide from whatever I had just witnessed. I backed away from the window, my breath coming in quick, shallow gasps. What had I seen? The man didn't move, just stood there, staring. I felt an overwhelming urge to peer outside again, to confront the unsettling image that had invaded my evening. I wrestled with myself, my curiosity battling against the fear that Mrs. Harrington had instilled in me. Finally, unable to resist, I approached the window once more and cautiously pulled back the curtain. The street was empty now. The man vanished as if he had never been there. They searched the darkness, scanning the shadows, but there was no sign of him, just an eerie stillness that filled the night air. Chilled, I decided to take Mrs. Harrington's advice to heart. I closed the curtains firmly and turned off the lights, hoping that would banish the unsettling feeling that had settled in my chest. Yet sleep eluded me. I tossed and turned, replaying the image of that man in my mind, wondering if he had been a figment of my imagination or something far more sinister. The next morning, I decided to pay Mrs. Harrington a visit. As I approached her porch, she looked up from her knitting, her eyes sparkling with a knowing light. You opened the curtains, didn't you? She asked, a hint of disappointment in her voice. I nodded, feeling sheepish. I saw a man. He was just standing there, and then he disappeared. I don't know what to make of it. Her expression shifted to one of concern. You should be careful, dear. The night holds secrets that aren't meant to be uncovered. She leaned closer, lowering her voice. He's been watching. He's done it before. Just don't let your curiosity get the better of you. I felt a wave of unease wash over me. I wanted to brush it off, to dismiss her fears as old wives' tales, but something about her tone sent chills down my spine. After our conversation, I returned home, locking the door and drawing the curtains tight, determined to ignore the outside world. Days passed, and life resumed its normal pace. But each night, as darkness fell, I felt the weight of my curiosity pressing down on me. I resisted the urge to look outside, but sleep became increasingly elusive. The image of the man lingered in my thoughts, haunting me like a persistent shadow. Then, one night, curiosity won out once more. I crept to the window, heart racing, and peered through the curtains. This time the street was deserted, but something felt different. A sense of dread hung in the air, thick and suffocating. I held my breath, waiting for something to happen. Just as I was about to pull away, I caught a flicker of movement at the far end of the street. There he was again, standing beneath the street lamp. My heart raced as I watched him. He appeared closer than before, the pale face illuminated by the harsh glow. I squinted, searching for recognition, but all I found were those hollow eyes, now seemingly fixed on me. Panic surged through me, and I stumbled back from the window, my breath coming in rapid gasps. What did he want? I felt trapped in a nightmare, unable to break free. I considered calling for help, but a part of me hesitated. What could I even say? There's a man standing in the street. No one would take me seriously. As the night wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I remained in the safety of my home, the curtains drawn, but I felt the oppressive weight of darkness pressing against the glass. I convinced myself I wouldn't look again, that I would heed Mrs. Harrington's warning. But the following night, sleep deprived and anxious, I found myself at the window again. This time, the man wasn't there, but the shadows felt alive, swirling and shifting. I leaned closer, fighting against the panic rising within me. 
Suddenly, I noticed something on the ground, a small object glinting in the moonlight. Compelled by an inexplicable force, I opened the window, the cool breeze rushing in. I reached down and picked up the object. It was a locket, old and tarnished, its chain broken. I opened it, revealing a faded photograph inside two smiling faces, frozen in time. My heart sank as I recognized the woman. It was Mrs. Harrington, decades younger, standing beside a man whose features mirrored the stranger I had seen. Terror washed over me as the pieces fell into place. The locket belonged to the man watching me, and somehow he was tied to Mrs. Harrington's past. I rushed to her house, adrenaline fueling my steps. When I arrived, I pounded on her door, breathless and frantic. Mrs. Harrington opened the door, her expression shifting from surprise to concern. You shouldn't have looked, she said, her voice barely a whisper. He's been searching for something, and now he knows you can see him. Before I could respond, the wind howled, and a chill swept through the air. The shadows behind her seemed to stretch and twist, the atmosphere thick with dread. I felt the weight of my choices bearing down on me, and for the first time I truly understood the power of the unknown. As I stood there, I knew that I had crossed a threshold. I had opened the curtains to the darkness, and now I had to face whatever awaited me on the other side. Story 19 it was a rainy Saturday afternoon when I stumbled upon the website while aimlessly scrolling through my phone. I had been feeling a little nostalgic, missing the carefree days of childhood spent exploring the woods and back roads of my small hometown. The site promised to reveal urban legends and eerie tales that had been passed down through generations, and I couldn't resist the allure of diving into the stories that shaped my childhood. As I began reading, I was drawn in by tales of ghostly figures, haunted places, and strange occurrences. There was a familiar comfort in the stories. They felt like echoes of conversations I'd had with friends around campfires, or imaginations running wild. The first few legends were typical mysterious lights in the woods, a haunted schoolhouse, and the infamous Whistler, a figure said to haunt a local park at night. I chuckled, reminiscing about how we dared each other to walk through those woods after dark clutching flashlights and holding our breath. Then I reached a legend titled The House at the End of Maple Lane. My stomach dropped as I read the chilling details. The story described an old, dilapidated house that stood alone at the edge of town, shrouded in overgrown weeds and shadows. It was said that the previous owner, a reclusive woman, had mysteriously vanished, leaving behind only whispers of her tragic fate. Some claimed to hear soft crying at night, while others reported seeing lights flickering in the windows long after the sun had set. The legend warned that anyone who dared to approach the house would be cursed, drawn into its dark history. I felt a chill run through me. That house was only a few blocks from where I lived, and I had always felt an inexplicable unease whenever I passed by. My friends and I had ventured near it during our teenage years, spooked but intrigued laughing nervously as we dared each other to knock on the door. But none of us had ever mustered the courage to step onto the property. As I continued reading, I was struck by a sense of familiarity in the story, as if the details were weaving into the fabric of my own life. I had always thought of the old house as an eyesore, a relic of a time long gone. But now, it felt like something far more sinister, I scrolled down to find a section for user submitted experiences and was startled to see several comments from people who claimed to have witnessed strange occurrences near the house. One user wrote about hearing whispers in the wind, while another described seeing shadowy figures flitting past the windows. The chilling tales rekindled memories of my own encounters times when I had felt an inexplicable presence around the house, the way the air would grow heavy and still as I passed. I had always dismissed those feelings, attributing them to overactive imagination, but now I felt a creeping dread that made me question everything. After a few more clicks, I found an old photograph submitted by a user who claimed to have left lived nearby. It was grainy but unmistakable, a picture of the house taken from the edge of the property, the tall grass obscuring the front steps. I felt a knot tighten in my stomach as I noticed something unusual in the corner of the image, a dark figure, barely discernible but undeniably present. I couldn't help but wonder if this was a mere coincidence, or if it was something more. 
Unable to shake the feeling, I decided to investigate further. My curiosity outweighed my fear. I reached out to a couple of friends who had she childhood fascination with local legends, and they agreed to join me on a late night expedition to the infamous house. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the streets, we gathered flashlights and snacks, excitement and apprehension mixing in the air. When we arrived at the house, a shroud of fog enveloped the area, enhancing the eerie atmosphere. The moon peeked through the clouds, illuminating the facade of the waste with an otherworldly glow. It loomed before us, a decaying monument to secrets long buried. I felt a mix of thrill and dread as we approached, the stories we'd read swirling in our minds like specters. And we took turns shining our flashlights through the broken windows, illuminating the remnants of a life once lived a dust-covered chair, an overturned table, and remnants of faded wallpaper peeling from the walls. My heart raced with each creak of the floorboards as we ventured further inside, the air heavy with the scent of mildew and forgotten memories. Then, as we explored the darkened rooms, we heard a soft, mournful cry that seemed to echo from deep within the house. My breath caught in my throat as we froze in place, exchanging nervous glances. Did you hear that? One friend whispered, her eyes wide with fear. Yeah, but it's probably just the wind, I replied, though my voice shook. I tried to dismiss it, but the sound was unmistakable, weaving through the stillness of the house, drawing us deeper into its grip. We pressed on, our curiosity driving us despite the creeping dread that settled in our bones. The crying grew louder, reverberating through the halls, until we stumbled upon a room at the back of the house. The door creeped open, revealing a small space filled with dust-covered furniture and what appeared to be a child's toys scattered across the floor. In the center of the room we found a small, ornate music box. It lay open its delicate mechanism still turning playing a haunting melody that sent chills down my spine. The music seemed to resonate with the very essence of the house, entwined with the whispers and cries that surrounded us. Just then, a cold breeze swept through the room, extinguishing our flashlights and plunging in us into darkness. Panic surged, and I could hear my friends breathing heavily beside me. We need to go, and one of them urged, her voice trembling. Ming. As we fumbled to find our way back, the crying intensified, wrapping around us like a shroud. I felt as though something was pulling me back, urging me to stay, to listen, but I couldn't bear the weight of it any longer. We bolted out of the house, hearts racing, stumbling into the cool night air. Once outside, we gathered ourselves, breathless and shaken. I looked back at the house, its dark silhouette looming against the night sky. In that moment, I understood that, that the legend wasn't just a story, it was a piece of history, intertwined with my own life. I realized I had been living within the tale, a participant in something far greater than myself. The music from the box still echoed in my mind, a reminder that some legends were born from pain, loss, and longing. As we drove away, the house faded into the distance, but the connection remained. I felt a sense of purpose, knowing that I had uncovered a part of my hometown's history, something that was both terrifying and beautiful. From that night on, I understood the power of stories and the ways they shape our lives. I had entered the realm of legend, and in doing so, I had found my place within it a living testament to the mysteries that linger in the shadows, waiting to be discovered. Story 20 I had always been fascinated by my family's history, a tapestry woven with tales of triumph and tragedy. After my grandmother passed away, I inherited her collection of photographs and keepsakes, a glimpse into the lives of those who came before me. While sifting through the dusty boxes in the attic, I discovered an old family photo tucked, tucked away in the corner of a faded album. The photograph was black and white, depicting a large gathering in front of a modest home. There were faces I recognized my great-grandparents, aunts, and uncles smiling in their Sunday best. It was a picture of happiness, but as I studied it more closely, something felt off. The colors were faded, but I noticed strange smudges in the background, like shadows that shouldn't have been there. Curiosity peak, I decided to take the photo to a local historian who specialized in genealogy. She was passionate about uncovering family secrets and had an eye for detail that I admired. When I arrived at her small office, I laid the photograph on her desk and she leaned in, adjusting her glasses. 
Interesting, she murmured, examining it closely. This seems to be from the late 1920s. What do you know about the family members in the Fofo? I explained who I recognized, but as I spoke, I couldn't shake the feeling that something else was lurking beneath the surface. The historian began to pull out a magnifying glass and a light box, meticulously examining the photo under different angles. See this, she said, pointing to a figure in the background. This shadow here, this isn't a typical smudge. It looks almost like a person. I squinted at the shadowy outline. It appeared to be a tall figure, obscured by a haze, their features indiscernible. My stomach dropped as I considered the implications. What does it mean? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She shook her head, her expression troubled. I can't say for certain, but it seems this photograph was tampered with. The original might have revealed more than what we see here. It's possible that this person was deliberately hidden. I felt a chill run down my spine. Who was this figure? Why were they concealed? I spent the next few days obsessing over the photo, researching everything I could about my family and the time period in which the picture was taken. I delved into records and newspapers, desperately seeking answers. One evening, I stumbled upon an article from 1927, buried deep in the archives of a local newspaper. It reported on a family scandal involving my great-grandparents a violent incident that had rocked the community. A relative had gone missing under suspicious circumstances, and whispers of betrayal and jealousy echoed through the town. My heart raced as I read the details. Was the shadow in the photograph connected to this mystery? I returned to the historian, eager to share my findings. As I laid the article on her desk, she studied it carefully, her brow furrowing in concentration. This is significant, she said. You should look into the missing relative. The truth could be hidden in your family's past. Motivated by the urgency of my discovery, I tracked down more information about the missing relative, a distant uncle named Thomas. His name appeared in various records, but details were sparse. It seemed he had vanished shortly after the family photo was taken. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was the figure in the photo hidden away to protect the family's reputation. As I pieced together the fragments of my ancestry, I uncovered a dark narrative that ran through my family's history secrets of betrayal, violence, and hidden identities. Each discovery felt like a step deeper into a labyrinth I could hardly comprehend. Eventually, I discovered a surviving branch of the family who lived just a few towns over. I contacted them, hoping to uncover more about Thomas and the events that led to his disappearance. When I arrived at their home, I was greeted by a warm, welcoming family who seemed eager to share their history. As we talked, I sensed a shadow hovering over the conversation whenever Thomas's name came up. I finally, an elderly woman spoke up, her voice quivering. He was a good man, but he was different. Our family didn't accept him for who he was. I leaned in, my heart pounding. Different how? The room fell silent. Finally, she sighed, as if the weight of the secret was too much to bear. That he loved someone he shouldn't have. It was a time when such things were not tolerated. The last anyone saw of him, he was arguing with your great-grandfather. After that, he just disappeared. The implications washed over me like a cold wave. The shadows in the photograph. The hidden figure could it be that my great-grandfather was responsible for Thomas's fate. I felt a sickening twist in my stomach as the pieces began to fall into place. That night, I returned home. The photograph clutched tightly in my hand. Underneath the faint glow of my desk lamp, I studied it again, desperate for clarity. As I examined the shadow, something within me stirred. I couldn't ignore the possibility that Thomas was reaching out from beyond, a silent cry for justice buried in the past. With renewed determination, I decided to confront my family's history head-on. I would find out what truly happened to Thomas, and in doing so, perhaps I could lay to rest the haunting shadows that had lingered for too long. The altered photograph had revealed more than just a secret, it had awakened a calling deep within me. I knew the road ahead would be fraught with challenges, but I felt an undeniable connection to Thomas. This journey was no longer just about uncovering the past, it was about honoring the truth and giving a voice to the silenced. I was ready to face whatever darkness lay ahead, driven by the hope that the secrets of my ancestry could finally see the light. Story 21 
When I adopted Luna, a fluffy gray tabby with striking green eyes, I was excited for companionship. After years of living alone, I felt an emptiness that only a pet could fill. Luna seemed perfect, playful yet calm, affectionate yet independent. She settled into her new home quickly, exploring every nook and cranny with curiosity. However, it wasn't long before I noticed something odd. Every evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon and shadows stretched across my living room, Luna would suddenly stop whatever she was doing. She'd fixate on a specific corner of the room, her body tense, eyes wide and unblinking. I wasn't the typical behavior of a cat intrigued by a fly or a rustling leaf. This was something deeper, something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. At first, I dismissed it as a quirk. Cats can be strange creatures, after all. But as the days turned into weeks, Luna's staring sessions became a regular occurrence. It was as if she were waiting for someone or something to appear. I would watch her heart pounding, feeling a mix of fascination and dread. Each time, the corner remained empty, but I could almost sense a presence in the air, a tension that seemed to pulse just beyond the threshold of perception. One evening, after a particularly long day at work, I sank into the couch, exhausted. Luna jumped onto my lap, purring softly, but as the clock struck eight, she abruptly leaped down and darted toward her corner. I sighed, attempting to ignore the familiar feeling of unease, yet tonight was different. As I sat there, I swore I heard a faint whisper, like a breeze passing through, though the windows were closed. My heart raced as I glanced at Luna, who was now sitting, tail flicking, still staring intently at the empty space. Luna, what do you see? I murmured, half laughing at myself for talking to a cat. But as I spoke, the whisper grew slightly louder, a series of soft, unintelligible words weaving through the silence of the room. I shook my head, trying to dismiss it as fatigue playing tricks on my mind. Maybe I needed to get out more, meet friends, or at least watch less horror on TV. The following days unfolded similarly, with Luna becoming more fixated on that corner. I found myself growing increasingly anxious. Friends suggested I look into getting her some toys, but that wasn't the issue. There was something about the way she stared, as if she were communicating with a world I couldn't see. It was unsettling, and I began to feel like a visitor in my own home. One weekend, I decided to do some spring cleaning, hoping a fresh start would ease the strange atmosphere. I rearranged furniture and vacuumed every inch of the living room. Yet, even after all my efforts, the corner room remained untouched and Luna resumed her vigil each evening as if it were her sacred duty. Curiosity got the better of me. I began researching feline behavior online, hoping to find some answers. Some sources spoke of cats being sensitive to energies and spirits, while others dismissed the idea entirely. A part of me was intrigued by the notion of spirits, but another part felt utterly foolish. I couldn't help but recall the stories I'd heard about pets sensing things that humans couldn't. Then one night, after a particularly long day, I sank into bed, utterly exhausted. I had decided to ignore Luna's antics for once and let sleep take me. But just as I drifted off, I felt a sudden chill sweep across the room. I jolted awake to find Luna at the foot of my bed, staring intently toward the corner, her fur standing on end. And my heart raced as the whispers returned, louder now, almost urgent. I knew I couldn't ignore this any longer. With a deep breath, I swung my legs over the side of the bed and walked over to Luna. And what is it? I whispered, kneeling beside her. I looked into the corner where she was staring, willing myself to see whatever she saw. The air felt thick, electric, and I shivered. Hello, I called, my voice trembling slightly. Silence answered, heavy and oppressive. I half expected something to respond, but nothing came. Still, I felt compelled to speak. If there's someone here, please show yourself. My heart thudded loudly in my chest. Luna's head tilted, as if she were trying to comprehend my words. I reached out to touch her, and at that moment, the air shifted. I felt a wave of warmth wash over me, accompanied by a gentle whisper that finally coalesced into a single word, home. Startled, I stood up, glancing around the room. I knew this was my home, but the word felt loaded, filled with emotions I couldn't articulate. I sank back down beside Luna, who was now kneading the floor, purring softly. Do you know what this means? I asked her, is someone, is someone here with us? That night, I couldn't sleep. 
I lay in bed, pondering the whispers and the feelings they evoked. I wondered if it was possible that someone who had lived in this house before me lingered here, attached to this corner, perhaps waiting for closure. Luna remained vigilant, her presence a comfort as I fought against the rising tide of fear. Over the next few days, I took a different approach. Instead of shying away from the strange occurrences, I decided to embrace them. I began researching the history of my home, uncovering its past owners and stories. There had been a family who lived here for decades, and a few years prior to my moving in, the matriarch of that family had passed away. With each discovery, I felt a connection to this unknown presence. Perhaps this was the spirit of the woman who had lived here, a protector of the home. I began leaving small offerings of flour from my garden, a handwritten note, a slice of bread hoping to acknowledge her presence. Each evening, as Luna resumed her watch, I felt less anxious and more at peace. One night, as I prepared for bed, I noticed Luna lying in the corner, her eyes fluttering as if she were dreaming. I approached her, crouching down to meet her gaze. Thank you for bringing this to my attention, I whispered, feeling a sense of gratitude. As I reached out to pet her, a wave of warmth washed over me, and I could have sworn I heard a gentle laugh, like a breeze through chimes. From that night on, I began to feel a sense of companionship not just with Luna, but with the spirit I believed inhabited my home. The atmosphere shifted, becoming lighter. The whispers faded, and the corner where Luna once stared began to feel like a cherished part of my life, rather than a source of dread. As the months passed, I settled into a new rhythm. Luna would occasionally glance at the corner, but it was different now. It felt less like waiting and more like a shared understanding. I would often find her curled up beside me as I read or worked, her purring a constant reminder that I was not alone. In a way, adopting Luna had opened a door to a new kind of connection, one that transcended the living and the lost. Together, we forged a home filled with warmth, love, and a respect for the past. And it was a reminder that even in the most unexpected places, we can find companionship, understanding, and a sense of belonging that defies the boundaries of life. Story 22 at first, it was just a feeling, an unsettling sensation that prickled the back of my neck whenever I was alone in the house. I dismissed it as my imagination, the product of too many late-night horror movies and an overactive mind. But as the weeks passed, the feeling grew stronger, and odd occurrences began to pile up, each one more unnerving than the last. It started with small things. One afternoon, while preparing lunch, I noticed the cabinet door slightly ajar. I could have sworn I had closed it before stepping away. I shrugged it off, attributing it to my distracted mind. But the next day, I found my favorite mug in the wrong cabinet, tucked away behind the plates. I thought maybe I was losing it, but the strange occurrences were only beginning. The real turning point came one evening when I settled into my living room with a book. The sunlight poured through the window, bathing everything in a warm glow. I was lost in the story when I heard a soft thud from the hallway. My heart skipped a beat. I placed my book down, straining to listen. Silence enveloped the house, heavy and oppressive. I shook my head, convincing myself it was just the house settling. A few nights later, I decided to watch a movie, the dim light from the screen casting flickering shadows around the room. Just as the film reached a tense moment, the power went out. I sat in darkness, heart pounding, listening to the silence. Moments later, the lights flickered back on and I could have sworn I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. My breath caught in my throat, but when I turned to look, there was nothing there. Each night I began to notice the pattern. Whenever I was home alone, strange things happened. Objects would shift slightly, as if moved by an unseen hand. I started leaving my phone on record mode, hoping to capture something anything on video. I wanted proof of the strange occurrences, but each morning the footage revealed nothing but silence and stillness. Then came the whispers. They were faint at first, like distant echoes carried on the wind. I would hear my name, soft and inviting, drawing me to the edge of understanding. But when I turned to investigate, there was only emptiness. It felt like I was being beckoned, and the feeling that I was being watched intensified. I confided in my friend Lisa, who laughed it off as typical overactive imagination. You probably just need to get out more, she said with a grin. But deep down, I felt something sinister was at play. I decided to investigate the history of the house, 
hoping to uncover anything that might explain the odd occurrences. The more I learned, the more unsettled I became. The house had been built in the late 1800s, and several families had lived there before me. There were whispers of a tragic accident a young girl had fallen down the stairs, her laughter echoing in the halls long after she was gone. I couldn't shake the feeling that her spirit was still here, intertwining with my own. One evening, determined to confront my fears, I set up a seance. I lit candles and gathered a few personal items, hoping to communicate with whatever presence lingered in the house. As I closed my eyes, I felt a chill in the air, a distinct change in the atmosphere. The whispers returned, clearer now, swirling around me like a gentle breeze. I felt a weight pressing down on me, and the candles flickered wildly. Suddenly the room grew colder, and I felt a rush of energy. My heart raced as I opened my eyes to find a shadow hovering in the corner, darker than the darkness surrounding it. I gasped, the fear paralyzing me, and I called out, Who are you? The shadow seemed to pulse, and in that moment I felt a mixture of dread and empathy. I wasn't sure if it was a malevolent force or a lost soul seeking help. Before I could process what was happening, the candles extinguished, plunging the room into darkness. I fumbled for my phone, the flashlight illuminating the corners of the room. Panic surged through me. The atmosphere felt charged, electric, and I could hear my own breathing echoing and effering in the silence. I decided to leave the room, but just as I reached the door, I heard a soft voice whisper, stay. The word reverberated through my body, filling me with an inexplicable urge to listen. I turned back, the flashlight beam shaking as it fell upon the shadow. I felt an overwhelming sense of sorrow emanating from it, and despite my fear, I stepped closer. I don't mean you any harm, I whispered, racing. Are you the one watching me? The shadow flickered, and for a moment I thought I saw a face a little girl with sad eyes staring back at me. Help me, she whispered, her voice barely audible. What do you need? I asked, my fear beginning to dissipate as compassion took its place. How can I help you? Uh, the shadow shifted, and I felt a rush of memories flooding my mind images of laughter, play, and the sudden stillness of a life cut short. I realized the girl had been trapped, her spirit unable to move on, lingering in the space where she had once known joy. I'm so sorry, I said, tears welling in my eyes. I didn't know. As I stood there, I made a silent promise to help her find peace. I decided to research her story further to learn more about her life and the events surrounding her death. I would honor her memory, perhaps even create a small memorial in the garden, a place where her spirit could feel free once more. In the days that followed, the strange occurrences continued, but they felt different, less ominous, and more like a gentle reminder of her presence. I often sensed her watching me, but it was no longer out of fear. Instead, it felt comforting, as if she was guiding me in my quest to uncover the truth. I found old newspaper clippings about the accident and reached out to local historians who knew the house's past. With each piece of the puzzle I uncovered, I felt a connection growing, bridging the gap between our worlds. I planned a small gathering in the garden, inviting friends to remember the girl and celebrate her life. The night of the gathering, I lit candles and placed them around a small flower filled with daisies, just like the ones I had planted. I shared the story of the girl inviting everyone to acknowledge her presence to recognize the importance of her life, however short it may have been. As we stood together, I felt a warmth enveloping us, a sense of release in the air. In that moment, the oppressive weight of the house lifted, and I sensed a shift. The watching presence transformed into one of comfort and gratitude. I knew she was finally at peace. I felt her spirit join us, a whisper of laughter carried by the wind, and I smiled, knowing I had helped her find freedom. Story 23 When I inherited my grandfather's old clock, I was filled with nostalgia. It was a grand piece crafted from dark wood with intricate carvings and a glass front that protected the clock face. The hands moved with a slow precision, and the ticking echoed in my small apartment, creating a comforting rhythm. Little did I know, this clock held more than just the passage of time. At first, it felt like a cherished heirloom, a connection to my grandfather's past. He had always been a storyteller, spinning tales of his youth and the adventures he had lived. But soon after I placed the clock on my mantle, 
I began to notice an unsettling pattern. The first instance was minor. The clock ticked ominously just before I received a phone call about a minor car accident involving a close friend. I brushed it off as coincidence, but as the days passed, the events that seemed to align with the clock's ticking grew increasingly alarming. One evening, as I sat reading, the clock chimed, resonating through the stillness of the room. I glanced at it, noting the time 7 p.m. moments later I received a text from my sister, her words frantic. She had been in an argument with her partner, and things had escalated to the point of calling the police. I couldn't help but feel an uneasy chill run down my spine. The incidents continued to pile up. Each time the clock struck or ticked loudly, a wave of anxiety would wash over me, almost as if it were a warning. One night it began ticking erratically just as I was about to leave for a friend's gathering. I hesitated, my gut twisting. Ignoring the feeling, I went anyway. A few hours later, I learned that a nearby building had caught fire, and the party was evacuated for safety. I felt a pang of guilt. What if I had stayed home? As the weeks turned into months, the clock's foreboding presence became a fixture in my life. I started to dread the sound of its ticking, wondering what misfortune it would herald next. It was as if the clock was an oracle, synchronizing itself with the events of my life in the most unsettling ways. I decided to seek answers. One rainy afternoon, I visited an antique shop, hoping to learn more about the clock's history. The shop owner, a wizened old man with a knowing gaze, listened intently as I described my experiences. Clocks have their own energy, he said, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. They can absorb emotions and events from the past. Yours may be linked to your grandfather's experiences. I asked him about my grandfather, eager to uncover any secrets. The owner's eyes narrowed. Your grandfather was a man of many trials. He faced losses that would weigh heavy on anyone's heart. If he imbued this clock with his emotions, it might carry remnants of those events. A chill ran through me. I had only ever known my grandfather as a loving, kind man, but I realized that he had lived through difficult times, wars, personal losses, and hardships. Could the clock be a vessel for his burdens? That evening, the clock ticked steadily as I pondered my next steps. The following morning, as I sat down for breakfast, it struck 8 a.m. Suddenly the power went out, plunging my apartment into darkness. I scrambled for my phone to check the news, and my heart sank as I read about a widespread outage in the area. My nerves were frayed, and I couldn't shake the feeling that the clock had once again signaled impending doom. Desperate for a solution, I decided to confront the clock itself. I set aside time to clean it thoroughly, hoping to rid it of any negative energy. I carefully polished the wood, dusted the clock face, and even talked to it, explaining my feelings and expressing my desire to separate my life from its ominous predictions. That evening, I felt a sense of relief. I set the clock back in its place and hoped for the best. Yet, as midnight approached, it began to tick louder than ever before. I closed my eyes, praying for peace, but the rhythmic sound reverberated through my mind, drowning out my thoughts. Then I woke suddenly, heart racing. The clock was stuck at 12.01 a.m. and the ticking had ceased. I rushed to check my phone, expecting to find the world had changed in the stillness of the night. A wave of panic surged through me when I saw a news alert. A train derailment had occurred just a few hours earlier. I felt like I was trapped in a web of fate, with the clock as my cruel puppet master. How could I escape its grasp? I couldn't take it anymore. I decided to get rid of the clock. As I prepared to leave for the antique shop to return it, the clock suddenly began ticking again, almost as if it was mocking me. I hesitated, my heart torn between preserving my grandfather's legacy and freeing myself from this burden. With shaking hands, I grabbed the clock and carried it out to my car. But just as I reached the vehicle, I froze. A cat darted across the road and I slammed on the brakes, narrowly avoiding an accident. The clock's ticking echoed in my ears, a reminder of how closely it had sensed with the dangers in my life. Determined to break free, I made my way back to the antique shop, heart pounding. I pushed open the door, and the shop owner looked up, a knowing smile on his face. Back so soon? He asked. I can't keep it, I admitted, placing the clock on the counter. It's its cursed. The owner examined it thoughtfully, 
Sometimes letting go is the only way to find peace. As I left the shop, I felt lighter, as if a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. The ticking that had haunted me for so long faded into the distance, replaced by the sounds of the world outside. I didn't know what would come next, but for the first time in months I felt hopeful. Life was unpredictable, but maybe I could navigate its challenges without the clock's ominous guidance. As I walked away, I realized that the past was just at the past and I was ready to embrace my future, ticking along at my own pace. Story 24 It started on an ordinary evening, the kind of night when the sky hung heavy with clouds and the air felt thick with humidity. I was curled up on the couch, a cup of tea warming my hands, lost in the pages of a novel. The world outside was quiet, the kind of stillness that often accompanies the onset of rain. It was peaceful, and I was grateful for the respite from the respite from the chaos of everyday life. Ill life. But then, just as I was about to lose myself completely in the story, I heard it. A faint whisper seeped through the walls, barely audible but distinctly there. I paused, listening intently, my heart thumping in my chest. It was as if someone was standing just outside the room, murmuring secrets meant for my ears alone. I shook my head, dismissing it as a figment of my imagination. After all, the mind can play tricks, especially in the solitude of night. I returned to my book, but the whispers returned, more insistent this time. Words I couldn't quite make out echoed through the plaster, slithering into my consciousness. What is happening? I murmured to myself, my grip tightening around the mug. The whispers faded, leaving an unsettling silence in their wake. I brushed it off as a fluke, an auditory hallucination. Perhaps it was the stress of work or the loneliness of living alone. I was tired. I needed sleep. But that night, sleep didn't come easily. I tossed and turned, the sound of my own thoughts echoing in my mind. Every time I closed my eyes, the whispers returned, clearer and more familiar. It felt as though they were weaving in and out of my thoughts, mingling with my internal monologue. Is this what I really want? A voice murmured, sounding achingly like my own. I shot up in bed, a cold sweat breaking out on my skin. I glanced around the dimly lit room, the shadows pooling in the corners. My heart raced. Was I truly losing my grip on reality? I shook my head, trying to dispel the unease that clung to me like a shroud. The next day was a blur of work and social obligations. The whispers banished to the back of my mind. I spoke to friends and colleagues, laughing and sharing stories, but as soon as I returned home, the unsettling quiet enveloped me once more. That evening, as I prepared dinner, the whispers began again, creeping through the walls like a chill wind. They curled around me, words slithering in and out of my thoughts, you're not good enough, they'll find out. I dropped the wooden spoon, staring at the kitchen wall in horror. These weren't just random whispers, they were echoes of my own insecurities. I could hardly breathe the weight of recognition pressing down on me. I thought I had long since buried those thoughts, the self-doubt that had plagued me for years. Stop it, I shouted, my voice echoing in the small space. But the whispers only grew louder, the cacophony of my worst fears swirling through the walls. I backed away, heart racing, feeling cornered by my own mind. It was as if the house had become a conduit for my darkest thoughts, amplifying the very insecurities I thought I had silenced. I grabbed my phone, searching for distractions, scrolling aimlessly through social media, but the words followed me. You're alone. Nothing you do matters. Ah, who matters? Panic set in. I felt as though I were losing my mind, trapped in a house that no longer felt like home. The whispers taunted me day and night, making every room feel suffocating. I tried to reason with myself. Perhaps the house was settling, causing strange sounds. But I knew it was more than that. It was the manifestation of my own psyche, a relentless echo chamber of my fears. Desperate for relief, I reached out to a friend, Sarah, inviting her over for a movie night. I needed a distraction, someone to share the space with. As we settled in with popcorn and snacks, I hoped the presence of another person would drown out the whispers, at least for a little while. But even with Sarah beside me, the whispers continued, just quieter, 
As the film played, I found it increasingly difficult to concentrate. Every time Sarah laughed or gasped, the shadows in my mind echoed back, mocking the happiness I was trying to feel. Are you okay? She asked, concern etching her features. Yeah, just a little tired, I replied, forcing a smile. As the night wore on, I tried to push the whispers away, focusing on the screen, but the words crept back in. You're a burden. You're always making excuses. I felt the weight of each phrase crushing down on me, smothering any joy I could find. I excused myself to the bathroom, closing the door behind me, and leaned against the cool tiles. This isn't real, I told myself. You're just stressed. But deep down, I knew the truth. This wasn't just stress, it was something darker, an emotional specter that had been lurking in the shadows of my mind for years. That night, I barely slept. I lay in bed and Max snuggled against my side, but the whispers grew more insistent, filling the silence with the chorus of my insecurities. You'll never be happy. You're not worthy of love. With every phrase, I felt my resolve weaken, the darkness gnawing at my sanity. I needed to confront this haunting, to face the thoughts that had plagued me for so long. The next day, I decided to take action. I began journaling, pouring my fears onto the page, confronting the whispers head on. I wrote about my insecurities, my worries, and my dreams. Each word was a release, a way to reclaim my narrative from the clutches of despair. At first, the whispers didn't fade. They continued to echo through the walls, relentless in their pursuit of my thoughts. But with each entry, I felt a shift within myself. I was acknowledging the darkness rather than running from it. I wrote about my strengths, the things I loved about myself, and slowly the whispers began to change. Instead of you're a failure, I could write you are capable of growth. Instead of no one cares, I wrote you are loved. Wrong. The more I confronted those whispers, the more they transformed. They began to lose their power, shifting from haunting echoes to mere whispers of the past. I could still hear them, but they no longer held the same weight. Weeks passed and the presence in my home began to change. The air felt lighter, the shadows receded, the walls that once echoed my fears now felt like a sanctuary of healing. I discovered that the whispers had been a reflection of my internal struggles, a call for me to face what I had long avoided. In time, I found solace in the space around me. Max lay comfortably at my feet, and as I continued to write and reflect, the sense of peace returned. The walls no longer felt oppressive, they became a canvas for my journey. What started as a haunting turned into a pathway for growth. A reminder that even in our darkest moments, we have the power to reclaim our narrative. And while the whispers may still linger at the edges of my mind, I now understand that they are merely echoes of the past, not the truth of who I am.